Church in recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Welcome back to my colleagues for another day of debate, a short week this week with the, uh, uh, this will be the final day this week, so I wish everyone uh, extended uh, good luck on the weekend and hope you get some R&R &R and hi to all those who are tuned in across Eastlink uh, and online. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to begin my uh, uh, remarks just with uh, recognition that April 2nd, while we're away, will be World Autism Day. Uh, and the Autism Society of Prince Edward Island is going to uh, partner with uh, DP Murphy, Inc., uh, Tim Hortons, and Wendy's locations across PEI, and uh, donations will be made for purchases uh, across the board for from April 1st to 3rd. So uh, thanks to all of those uh, to for making that possible. I want to also recognize Samuel Lowe, a Grace Christian uh, st uh, school student, uh, who after having uh, had delayed his graduation by a year due to concussion, he suffered which I believe was from hockey, Mr. Speaker, uh, has been awarded a prestigious Lauren Scholarship worth $100,000, Mr. Speaker, uh, one of 30 uh, awarded out of 6,000 across the... So uh, very, very good news and congratulations to Samuel. Also was very pleased to hear Angie Arsenault uh, and uh, as a new member of the uh, New London Fire Department uh, taking an active lead in, in promoting PEI, the Firefighters 50-50 draw, uh, doing wonderful work and raising important money, Mr. Speaker, and I know that's a background of which you come from so you can appreciate, like all of us, the work that goes in to all of these volunteer organizations and how important they are across PEI. And to date, it has raised over $134,000, so a pretty big uh, piece of work, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and on the heels of our Restaurant Association uh, dine-in promotion, Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to see the Meat and Potatoes campaign uh, with participating restaurants, again, offering culinary excellence of local products across PEI. Just one more reason to get out. Uh, and enjoy uh, the wonderful offerings in this province, Mr. Speaker. And finally, Mr. Speaker, the ongoing saga has come to an end. The PEI Junior C Championships have ended uh, rather abruptly for the team from the East, Mr. Speaker. A 3 nothing sweep in the best of five series. Uh, the Tignish uh, Aces, of course, uh, kind of played a little possum a long way in, in, in the... Uh, in the regular season. They've been known to do that from time to time. And uh, the playoffs kicked in, and lo and behold, they went 6-0. and all. Mr. Speaker never lost a game uh, and were crowned the, uh, uh, the Razzies PEI Junior C Championship. So to all the players, coaches, sponsors, and supporters of the Junior C team in Tignish, congratulations. And to the Ice Dogs in Georgetown, uh, like the Toronto Maple Leafs, Mr. Speaker, let's look for next year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. John, the leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I, I'd first like to uh, congratulate the Women's Institute here on PEI, who spearheaded once again the Taking Care of Women's Business period campaign, which uh, happens during February. Uh, and this year they raised over $5,000 in monetary and product donations. And of course, as every year, uh, that was matched by Murphy's Pharmacy. So thank you to Ray Murphy and the, Phar and the Murphy Pharmacy Group for that ongoing support for this really important campaign. I also want to thank the Women's Institute, and, and specifically Bridget McCormick, who we all know, of course, uh, who uh, works just along the hall here. Uh, we know her through her administrative work here in the Legislative Assembly, but in her life outside of this office, uh, she is on the Provincial <coughs> WI Board, and she's actually the person who spearheads this campaign. So congratulations to you, Bridget, for another great year. Uh, tomorrow marks the beginning of the daffodil campaign for the Canadian Cancer Society. That This is something that's been going on for over 70 years now and uh, raising money for important research and also for supports for those who are living with cancer. And uh, the daffodil is a symbol because it's one of the first flowers to spring, uh, to uh, bloom in the spring. And it's a symbol to those who are living with cancer of strength and of courage and of hope for the future. So uh, given that nearly one out of every two Canadians during their lifetime will be diagnosed with cancer at some point, uh, the Can Canadian Cancer Society um, helps almost half of Canadians throughout their lifetime in some way or another. So when you see the, 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 the uh, daffodils that will, be, that will start to be worn tomorrow for the, for the month of May, uh, consider making a donation to them. It's also, of course, uh, this weekend, those spring religious festivals. It's Easter, it's Ramadan, it's, Pas it's Passover. All of those 
uh, festivals, and really important religious festivals that coincide with spring, uh, a time of renewal and rebirth. And um, so I want to wish everybody a happy Ramadan, happy Passover, and happy Easter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's great to rise today, and I too would like to congratulate the Junior C team from Tignish on their victory. That's wonderful. I'd also like to wish all my colleagues here in the legislature and all Islanders a happy Easter since we're coming into that weekend. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say hello to all the residents back in Evangeline and Squish. Mr. Speaker, I had a pretty special weekend. I meant to mention this yesterday, but I had uh, my only granddaughter, Adeline Gallant, had her third birthday, and she turned three on the 26th, and I turned 65 on the 27th. <laughs> so we celebrated it together, and it was quite a day. And she had quite a weekend because of the COVID regulations. We couldn't all get together like the two families, her mom, Shannon's family, and, and uh, Chris, dad. So we had hours with her on Saturday, and then she had another one on Sunday with the Bradleys. And uh, I don't know how they're going to correct her on that next year when, she tell her, when they tell her she can't have two birthdays, but she <laughs> will, she'll have fond memories of this past weekend because it was all about her, and she's a pretty sweet little girl. And also, I'd like to mention uh, today, March 31st, is the International Transgender Day of Visibility. This is an, an annual event dedicated to celebrating trans, trans people and raising awareness and discrimination faced by transgender people around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Master of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, rise today. And uh, I want to give a shout out this morning. I had the opportunity to uh, uh, represent government to uh, this little ceremony, Summerside, for uh, its connections to employment. And it's uh, administered by the Honorable Members, uh, Department from uh, Culture and Tourism and Innovation. But uh, a real shout out to these these individuals that uh, partake in this year, this uh, program to better their lives and uh, and become leaders in our community and I'll give a shout out to the honorable member from Summerside there she was there with it and uh, it was just good to see how these young people talked about their experience in wanting to better their lives and uh, and become gainful employment and so on and I found it very special to hear their stories and uh, and listen to what they had to say so thank you Mr. Speaker. The honorable member from O'Leary and Furness, third party whip. Mr. Speaker, and I want to welcome all those watching online and uh, on the TV network in East Link as well, Mr. Speaker, the proceedings here today. But uh, as you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, the rep riding I represent, O'Leary Inverness, is always well known for its love of potatoes and oysters. But uh, if there's a third thing that we really uh, have a passion for in the riding is hockey. And, uh, and obviously I boast many times in the legislature here that um, the MLA representing uh, Kraft Hockeyville Canada 2017. And, uh, but I was very interested to see some of the achievements of one of our uh, particular players uh, from my riding. Uh, a girl, 15-year-old uh, girl, Chloe Gallant uh, from Inverness. Uh, she uh, was selected as one of 21 Canadian females that were selected to be part of the Scotia Rising Teammates Mentorship Program. And uh, that's quite an accomplishment for her to, uh, to achieve that. And we certainly wish her well uh, in, uh, in that uh, proceeding. Uh, but she's the 15-year-old daughter of Corey and Melissa Gallant from my riding, Mr. Speaker. But if, the, if there's any Boston Bruins scouts out there that are uh, maybe listening in here today, I just want to go through some of her statistics. She's uh, 15 years old. Like I said, she plays in the PEI Under-18 uh, AAA Female Hockey League, and she's a member of the Western Wind. But in 22 games, she scored 19 goals, 14 assists, 33 points, and led the league in scoring uh, for the 2021 season. So that's quite an accomplishment. So we certainly wish Chloe all the best and uh, uh, wish her very successful uh, uh, Scotia Rising uh, mentorship program. And in uh, some of the people that she'll be paired a bit with is uh, Natalie Spooner and uh, uh, Another, let's see, Blair, I think her name was Blair from Stelton. So uh, anyway, that's, those are pretty high-end uh, hockey players that have uh, done really well in the female hockey in Canada, Mr. Speaker. So, so I, I think there's going to be a good future for Chloe in the hockey profession. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, of course, like to welcome all of my colleagues and everyone watching uh, online from uh, District 10, Charlottetown, Winslow. Uh, last night after adjournment, uh, Mr. Speaker, I had to go and uh, pick up my daughter who was uh, doing power skating at the Cody Banks Arena in Sherwood. Uh, as I was uh, driving to pick her up, I noticed a gentleman outside raking his leaves and I said I'd better stop in and say hello to this gentleman. So I pulled in and we talked for a few minutes and I uh, just wanted to say hello. And 
I said, uh, yeah, so are there any uh, concerns, you know, that uh, you'd like to brought up for District 10? And Mr. Speaker, he specifically wanted to talk about you and all the great work that you do in uh, District 1, Surrey, Elmira. Uh, he said, make sure you tell uh, Mr. Speaker that he is doing a great job. And uh, he said, if he encourages, of course, all Islanders to head down Surrey Way and yeah, contact name. you. Uh, <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, this gentleman uh, is a very well-known uh, person uh, in Sherwood and, of course, across PEI. And I'm sure that most oh, people probably. inside the house may know who he is. Uh, anyone in the sporting community specifically would obviously know who this person is. And this year, I believe, if I'm correct in saying, would be his 51st year in radio on PEI. Oh, David. And in the words of uh, Paul Harvey, and now you know the rest of the story, so a big hello to Dave Holland. Thank you very much for listening. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I say good morning to anyone watching from uh, Charlottetown Victoria Park. And I guess not good morning, good afternoon. And to all members in the legislature, I had the pleasure last evening of attending the uh, consultation over Zoom for the pre-kindergarten program. So a thank you to all of the parents who took part in that. It was really valuable feedback. And as was mentioned, today is the International Transgender Day of Visibility. And it's a day where we honor and empower those living in our, living in our communities who are trans transgender and non-binary. And uh, I would love to just take this opportunity to encourage, remind government to ensure that we're using a trans and non-binary lens and when making all of our decisions that impact them, whether that be health, education, infrastructure, and that representation matters. So while uh, trans and non-binary people are not necessarily reflected physically in this legislature, um, it's important that uh, they are reflected in every decision program and policy at every level. And so a special hello and thank you to members of our transgender non-binary community on PEI where we understand it is a struggle and how much courage it takes simply to be yourself every day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land Minister responsible for Justice, Public Safety and the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I rise today to uh, wish everyone in District 8 uh, uh, as the Holy Weekend comes about upon us, uh, Happy Easter, and uh, I encourage everyone to get out and uh, encourage everyone to come to District 8 to enjoy the trails. We have the National Park there, Mr. Speaker, with some of the, the best trails anywhere on this island, and then we have the Winter River Trail as well, Mr. Speaker, some fabulous trails in District 8. Um, Mr. Speaker, and the farmer in me is... Uh, the conversation of with all my colleagues in the farming world is how fast the land is drying out, Mr. Speaker, and the smells, and that is really getting you going here, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to the spring coming, Mr. Speaker, so we can turn the soil over here, and uh, we're looking forward to that. I also want to give a shout out to two constituents, uh, Francis and Gordon Coles, Mr. Speaker. Tomorrow will be their 60th anniversary, and they must have got married when they were teenagers, Mr. Speaker, because uh, they're a great couple, they're great supporters, and uh, Gordon's a big Leafs fan, so uh, happy anniversary to them. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise in the House today, and I want to jump off something that the Minister of uh, Fisheries and Communities was saying. We had the absolute pleasure this morning to be at the closing ceremony for the East Prince uh, Youth Development Program. They were running a Connection to Employment Program, Mr. Speaker, and it's actually the first program that they have ran that does job readiness and life skills together. So I wanted to say a congratulations, first of all, to those 10 amazing participants who went through it. I'm sure the minister would agree with me that their remarks this morning were touching and inspiring what they have uh, accomplished in that short period of time is remarkable and we should be really proud of them. But I really want to give uh, credit to the Minister of Economic Growth and Tourism, Mr. Speaker, because he and I spoke about the need for a life skills program in the realm of economic development and he agreed with me, he got it funded. Those 10 participants graduated today and they are in a far better position than they were. So I want to thank you for that, Minister. I really do. And then additionally, while I'm on my feet, Mr. Speaker, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge it is my nephew Ramsey's 15th birthday. Oh, wow. He's probably going to kill me for announcing this in the house, but I'm pretty proud of him, Mr. Speaker, so I just wanted to say congratulations to him, too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member from Tignish Pomero, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise my feet and uh, welcome everyone from Tignish Pomero and right across this fine island who are watching live today and uh, wish everyone a, a happy Easter and let's not forget what this, uh, what this uh, special week is about, a holy week. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, the Tignish Perry's Construction uh, ACES uh, on their provincial championship uh, last night in Pondle. Um, I want to congratulate all the players, uh, all the team staff, the families and the supporters uh, who made this happen and bringing the cup back to Tignish again. Um, and I do want to commend the Premier for graciously accepting defeat as a Georgetown boy. So, uh, so graciously accepting defeat is something that I think we'll hear again in a few years. Thank you. <laughs> Did I miss anyone? <laughs> the Honourable yeah. Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, welcome to online listeners from Brighton and elsewhere, and please have a great holiday weekend uh, when you're finished listening. I also welcome Dr. Morrison's decision to place the AstraZeneca vaccine on hold. Some are disturbed when leaders change their mind, but I'm only impressed. The world always changes. It's a sign of true leadership when leaders and rules also change as needed. By the way, the AstraZeneca vaccine changed its name and is now called Vax Severe and still is, despite concerns, still far better option than no shot. Being the senior member of the House, I'm happy to let everyone know that I will be getting my first shot on Monday, and I hope that all you honorable youngsters will get a shot <laughs> soon too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Member statements. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So soon again. Um, there's been a lot of talk about conflict between landlords and tenants lately. However, there has been almost no talk about avoiding this conflict altogether by building resident-controlled housing complexes, such as housing cooperatives, or co-housing. In these types of projects, such conflicts are avoided for the simple reason that there are no landlords and no tenants. A few decades ago, the federal government ran a co-op housing program that featured 100% low interest financing and upfront funds for initial development. That program no longer exists, but there's no reason that our government cannot support such a program here on PEI. Cooperatives have a proud history on PEI. Some of those that remain today includes ADL and the Ticknish Fishing Co-op, as well as the credit unions. But there have been setbacks as well. For instance, some food co-ops disappearing. And the housing co-ops lost their funding for new projects decades ago. Yet, resident-controlled housing is exactly what we need as a third choice between the two current choices of either buying or building a house or renting an apartment. We need financing and, above all, education. Living together in a housing project can have tremendous advantages. Children love it, and people needing support like seniors can <laughs> have that as well. I speak from experience as my wife and I created one of the first co-ops here on PEI and raised our son there. It was like living with an extended family. But, Mr. Speaker, creating a successful housing project also requires that people know what they're getting into. Unlike apartments, where you just pay the rent, any kind of cooperative or co-housing project requires long and careful planning, as well as a membership who understand that a successful project only happens when everyone is involved and do their part. This is where the government can help. Provide the upfront funding and education for co-ops so the co-ops can become a vibrant movement and housing option again. Islanders clearly need more housing options. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness, Third Party Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recently, the Nature Conservancy of Canada informed me that the organization recently purchased 119 acres of property in the riding of O'Leary Inverness on the co-op road in Enmore. 
This marks a total land purchase of 666 acres in the Enmore area, all in one parcel owned by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. With the recent additional purchase of land, the Enmore site is now the largest protected block of land on Prince Edward Island. The Percival River parcel of land is home to a wide variety of lichen species and a forest which is made up of spruce, aspen, birch, ash, and white cedar. All of these are what's known as the Acadian forest species of woodland. This area is also home to many birds and mammals indigenous to PEI. Mr. Speaker, the Nature Conservancy of Canada does great work in preserving ecosystems on PEI and has made numerous other purchases in the riding, including at the Conway Sandhills, where I personally made a contribution of 55 acres of uh, land a few years ago. The Nature Conservancy of Canada has been operating on PEI since 1978, and they have managed to protect almost 5,800 acres in ecologically significant parts of the province. The Nature Conservancy has secured 23 protected areas from across the province with the help of partners donating private land. Mr. Speaker, Islanders are so appreciative of the great work done by the Nature Conservancy of Canada to preserve PEI's unique habitats, and I look forward to seeing what their work will continue on in PEI into the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Time Valley Shorebrook, the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I asked the Minister of Health about a rumour that the puck at the Prince County Hospital had been closed. I don't like asking questions based on rumours, Mr. Speaker, but the potential implications of yet another puck closure without any public announcement were too much for me to just leave alone, so I asked. And to my surprise, the Minister confirmed that the puck was closed, or rather, to quote, it was absorbed. This is not an isolated incident. Since before this government came into power, we have seen concerning behaviour and inaction when it comes to the mental health and addictions crisis. The Premier ran on a platform, promising shovels in the ground on day one for the new mental health hospital, but did nothing to make that a reality once he got in. He then asks us to take the politics out of mental health, when in fact, in fact he wrote the book on this. <laughs> And his Minister of Health follows his lead. Sell a hopeful story. Don't follow through. The mental health campus is finally breaking ground with two buildings. It, this is encouraging, but I fear that it's just another hopeful story. Mr. Speaker, we can't staff a puck. We can't staff a mobile crisis unit. How are we going to staff a hospital? This fall, the puck in Charlottetown was closed. The Minister at that time promised that it would be reopened as soon as staffing challenges could be addressed. Instead, the puck in Summerside closed too, Mr. Speaker. These programs <coughs> won health PEI awards for ingenuity and positive feedback they received from mental health patients. Finally, as I'm sure you are all aware, the mobile mental health crisis unit rollout is not going well, and that's an understatement. First, we were told that the units would be ready to go in January. Then they were ready to go in March. Now we're not being given a date at all. Originally, the police were involved on every call. Then we found out that police will not be on every call. Next, we come to find out that Health PEI isn't going to be managing the units anymore. A private company, MetaV, will be managing them. Then the minister says, nope, that Health PEI will manage the units. Mr. Speaker, you can see how one can get confused and frustrated. When yesterday's news of the puck closure in Summerside was shared on Facebook, someone asked the question, what's next to go? The response from another person was, people's lives. Mr. Speaker, I am not trying to politicize mental health. I am asking that we start working on the mental health and addictions file in a meaningful and honest way, and that we start treating mental health and addictions with the dignity and respect it deserves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notes. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on uh, March the 26th, the uh, member, the Honourable Member, for O'Leary Inverness, asked to uh, uh, submit a written question, and it was written as, please provide the number of vehicles turned away at the Confederation Bridge between April 12, 2020 and March 25, 2021, and the costs incurred by the province for returning crossings on the Confederation Bridge. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to bring this information back as requested. The answer to the question 
there were 803 vehicles turned around at the Confederation Bridge between April 12, 2020 and March 25, 2021. The costs incurred for crossings on the Confederation Bridge during those dates was a total of $25,975.75. And the department stopped paying the bridge tolls for these turnarounds as of December 13th, 2020. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday I committed to bring back information to the House on a study being completed by the Community Sector Network. I'd like to clarify that the Community Sector Network uh, chose to undertake a study to uncover labour market impacts and do an economic impact analysis for the community sector. And so the Department of Social Development and Housing provided funding to the Community Sector Network to hire a program manager to coordinate the study. An RFP was issued and the network, through the steering committee, uh, awarded the RFP to the Atlantic Province's Economic Council, APEC, uh, to complete the study. So ACOA and Regional and Rural Development actually jointly paid for this. Um, and uh, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Balvedere was correct in identifying that the research and analysis was to be completed by the end of this fiscal. However, Mr. Speaker, uh, APEC, uh, the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council, uh, requested an extension until the end of May um, as surveys are being collected until uh, April. And um, as, as the Department of Social Development and Housing really does look forward to receiving the results from APEC on how best to support the network with their endeavours. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I also committed to bring back information regarding the province's alternative care provider program. Uh, so the alternative care provider program was launched in 2017 as a pilot from a response to strong community advocacy to provide financial support to grandparents and other caregivers who are raising children who are unable to live with their biological parents due to involvement with child protection. I think we're aware of that. Uh, the Honourable Member was correct in identifying that currently an active open child protection file remains part of the criteria to be eligible to enter the program. So the department is currently looking at the best option for continuing to service the clients who are part of the program that no longer have an open child protection file, but may require supports, including financial. So Mr. Speaker, I, I do need to take a moment to address recent comments regarding child protection in this program. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park stated, it seems odd, quote, that we would require children be in danger to that extent before we step in to provide support. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this type of commentary and language perpetuates a negative image about child protection and the Division of Child and Family Services works tirelessly not only to support the safety and security of all island children, but also to reduce stigma around the duty to report and child protection work in and of itself. Um, so the pilot was initially established with, within child protection, uh, within child and family services, and not under a traditional funding division. Due to this, the program has a strong safety lens and is focused on supporting family reunification and permanency planning, not solely providing finances, as is the request for many that seek to enter the program. Mr. Speaker, it's important to mention that the role of the division is to always act in the best interest of the child in any and all cases that come to our attention. So, Mr. Speaker, the Alternative Care Provider Program is and it's sensitive and it's complicated as it deals with the well-being of children and families, and it's imperative that its review be conducted thoroughly and in a comprehensive and collaborative way. And above all, Mr. Speaker, decisions need to be made in the best interest of the child. Reunification is a top priority. Where's the policy? So in fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, I confirmed that this program, um, in fact, is not actually out of the pilot stage, and government is currently reviewing options for the program that best suits the needs of those accessing and requesting services. And so once these decisions are finalized, they're not finalized yet, I will be pleased to provide the opposition leaders a copy of the corresponding policy. So, Mr. Speaker, I believe in transparency and open communication, and I issued the letter to the honourable member um, that the one that, that Char the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park references in the spirit of true collaboration and information sharing. It was not a letter I had to send. I sent that to update the opposition, third party and official opposition. And to suggest a lack of transparency on this file is simply untrue. As mentioned, once government solidifies program and policy changes, I will be pleased to update the House at that time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Minister, can I make a suggestion? Sure. Next time, table it. Very good. Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Mr. Speaker, in response to a question that was brought forward by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition with regard to the Rural Health Initiative uh, Survey Report, Mr. Speaker, the focus groups that were taking place in advance of uh, the drafting and putting together of that report have just completed, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I uh, certainly, when the report is complete, it will be made public, and uh, if the legislature is uh, sitting at that time, I will certainly table a copy of it here, Mr. Speaker. And the target date to have that completed by, Mr. Speaker, is the end of April. Thank you. No more? <laughs> For our first question, I'll call on the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, the Premier, in response to some of my questions about the blockages in receiving information from government, said that he was, and I quote, committed to openness and transparency and will try and help in every way that I can, end quote. And I appreciate the offer for assistance. Some departments seem to be more willing to share than others. And in our experience, one of the worst is the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Last July, for example, we asked for information on the policies, procedures, methodologies, and decision-making tools used to decide which roads get paved. It's now eight months later, eight months, and we haven't received an update in more than four months, and indeed, we haven't received any records relating to our request to the Premier. As elected officials, I understand that we can't actually get involved in the FOI process, so you can't help me here, I get that. But do you find this acceptable? No, Mr. Well, Premier. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sorry I was uh, premature in getting up here. But uh, no, no. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for the question, and I think I do want to help. We all want to help. Uh, I think it's important that information uh, that is public information be uh, dispatched as quickly as it can to those who are looking for it. Uh, as I said yesterday, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think there are issues within some departments, and I think we need to do a better job of this as a government and whole, of making sure the resources are there so people can dedicate the time needed to some of these often uh, comprehensive requests, Mr. Speaker. But uh, I think that uh, we can do a much better job, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I will, uh, to the extent that I can, uh, not as a micromanager in this job, but I can uh, make a request to my deputy to find out what the issues are and how we might go about internally to uh, try to correct them. Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. And uh, this is not the first time that the Department of Transportation Infrastructure has tried to stonewall opposition parties. We had the same experience with the contract for Clifford Lee. It took months and months to get records related to his hiring, which finally produced a single redacted contract. And then it took us more months of appealing to the Information and Privacy Commissioner before the unredacted contract was finally in our hands. A question to the Premier. Where is the accountability for senior government officials that block Islanders' access to information? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would, you know, I would suggest that, uh, you know, without painting everybody with one brush across the board, that I, I don't think it's anyone's intention in government to block information. I do think some there are challenges within uh, the FOIP legislation that need to be improved. Uh, I've never run into anyone in my limited time there where somebody seemed to be not trying to get the information out. So whether they're bound by uh, some challenges, uh, resource-wise or otherwise, I don't know, but. Uh, um, uh, I think in the, in the situation that he referenced with the former housing uh, director, Mr. Speaker, that that issue was rectified on this end, uh, that needed to be uh, rectified, and, uh, and uh, the information, I believe, got out. I'll, I'll try to undertake to do the best we can, Mr. Speaker. I don't think you should need to wait uh, extensive periods of time to get information that should be readily made public, and uh, uh, I'll just continue to try to help in any way I can. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Now, you're a busy man, Premier, and I don't think it should be your responsibility to make this happen. Indeed, if it is a resource issue, we need to, we need to deal with that. The former Minister of Transportation has said that he relies on the experts in his department when it comes to prioritizing road projects. But when March, his alter ego kicks in, he also states that he is actually the one making the decisions, and he wants the MLAs to come to him personally about which roads should be fixed. To the Premier, help me out here. When it comes to paving, are ministers following the expert advice and the policies, which presumably don't even exist, although we're waiting to see, are they following their expert advice or 
Are they following their political impulses? Mr. Speaker, uh, look, I think if we trace back a year uh, to our journey through COVID, I think this government has done very well listening to uh, the experts and following that advice uh, to a T, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the honourable member from Charlottetown Brighton referenced the fact that uh, uh, through this challenge, information has changed and we had a change along with it and we followed that advice. I think everyone uh, elected has to follow the best advice, Mr. Speaker. And in terms of uh, the paving situation, Mr. Speaker, I think. Uh, I'm open to, to try to help. Uh, I get the same calls you're getting, obviously, from District 17 about paving, and uh, uh, we paved a lot of roads last year. We have more to do, and I'd like to do that as fairly and equitably as possible, Mr. Speaker, like we do with every government program. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. We all know that the Access and Privacy Services Office receives FOIP requests and, and works to obtain those records sought by the applicants, whether it's somebody in a legislative office or in the media or, in the pri or a private citizen. However, it's very difficult, in fact near impossible, for APSO to do its job if government departments are not playing ball to ensure that the timely response to information is there. To the Minister of Justice. To what degree are individual departments responsible for the current backlogs that we are all experiencing and the delays in the FOIC process? The Honourable Minister of Justice, Public Safety and Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it's a very important question. And those, uh, I don't have those timelines right in front of me, but I know each department's different. They're working towards uh, a timely matter, Mr. Speaker. And uh, some departments are forced to uh, have a lot more uh, work involved with that, Mr. Speaker, and but uh, we'll look at the options of how we can improve this process, Mr. Speaker, and going forward, we can get the access to information out quicker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks again, Speaker. Access to information is, is one ongoing irritant for those of us whose job it is to hold government to account. But equally distressing is when government isn't forthcoming with information that they make about decisions. Again, this tends to be spotty. For example, the emergency rooms in the Alberton or Kings County Memorial Hospitals are closed often due to a lack of staffing, and it's almost always announced, as it absolutely should be. But when we permanently shut down psychiatric emergency facilities like the Pucks, not a word. To the Premier. Your government will announce the temporary closure of uh, an ER in one of our rural hospitals, but not when you permanently close an essential part of our mental health services. Is government more concerned about s serving islanders or serving itself? Uh, well, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's, you know, uh, I think we need to inform the public. I think if we could take a quick history of the the, the pucks were instituted at a time uh, for two particular reasons, Mr. Speaker. One, we had decanted our hospitals and we had some staff that could be redeployed, and we needed to separate as much of the emergency services as we possibly could from a COVID perspective to protect the staff, Mr. Speaker. So cohorts in the emergency room were one cohort, cohort in the puck was a different one, and they were separated for that reason, Mr. Speaker. In the process of that, uh, we delivered a great service, Mr. Speaker. No one is no one is debating that. As we opened, as we uh, brought more people back into our hospital, as we learned more about COVID, and we changed some of the realizations uh, of what we're doing from a healthcare perspective, uh, we, we went back to offering the services. Uh, through our care teams at the emergency rooms, Mr. Speaker, strictly from a health human resource perspective. I don't think it's any secret in here that we struggle as a province, as, as a jurisdiction, when it comes to the health human resources, Mr. Speaker, and we're working to address that. It is a difficult situation. We're working hard at it. We're trying to be as creative and innovative as possible. But we haven't closed a service. The services are still there, Mr. Speaker. They're integrated now into the ER. The care teams are still there at each of these individual locations, Mr. Speaker, trying to offer the best service we can to Islanders. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recent government announcements include an increase in help for adapting homes for seniors so they can stay at home longer. Unfortunately, this help only applies to seniors owning their own home. Question to the Minister of Housing and Social Development. Please tell us why you do not offer the same assistance to tenants who are arguably less able to pay for capital improvements. 
Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and and th this is a, this is a good point. Um, um, I wasn't aware that this was our practice. I have to admit, and, and, and Mr. Speaker, I think uh, the. Uh, in particular, the initiatives we have for helping seniors stay in their own homes should, should apply to all seniors, whether that's uh, providing services for, for them to, for independent living and these sorts of things. Um, now, Mr. Speaker, there's a variety of services, and maybe the member can clarify which ones he's talking about. Uh, the seniors uh, safe at home would be one. I would ex I expect we could help with renovations to make the home safe for tenants as well as homeowners. The seniors home repair program, that one might... Uh, uh, be a different story if we had to change that to make that available to tenants it might not make sense but let's talk about it and let's uh, let's do the we what we can to keep seniors in their own homes member from Charlottetown Brighton uh, thank you mr. speaker and uh, I'm glad you are now aware of it I think I brought it out in the house uh, more than a year ago um, of course improvements in an apartment building needs the approval of the landlord but that should not be too difficult to obtain as an accessible apartment is sought after by many. Question to the Minister, would you allow landlords to access these funds if the tenants require? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, I, I think it's, it's an idea that really bears uh, further consideration. It, it's a, it is a potentially a complex one. Um, we would have to, to make sure we administered it uh, properly. And of course, uh, any money that was given to a tenant to make improvements for, uh, or a landlord to make improvements for a specific tenant went into the, exactly what it was supposed to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, let, let's discuss it. Let's consider it. Again, I think the seniors safe at home, you know, these are improvements to make sure that the, the home is safer, you know, handrails and bathtubs and things like that. It should be a, almost a no-brainer. But when you're talking about fundamental improvements, like the seniors' home repair to the roof and that sort of thing, we might have to, to, to really consider the implications. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. John Bonnemann from Charlottetown, Brighton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the answer. I think I was talking more about ramps and other specific improvements like that. Um, currently, home care is strictly limited, yet government-sponsored long-term long -term care facilities Cost way more per day to operate. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. When are you going to raise the limit for home care to similar levels as actual cost at LTC facilities uh, as seniors are happier at home and the government saves money as well? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the Honourable Member is absolutely right. Seniors are happier at home, and that is one of the reasons, Mr. Speaker, that we have initiated a number of programs, enhancements to uh, uh, home care, the COACH program. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for example, in the speech from the throne, we had a new home respite program that was announced. There is a dementia team that is being put in place. Expansions to other programs, Mr. Speaker, such as restorative care, mobile integrated health. Mr. Speaker, seniors being kept in their home is certainly a priority of our government, and working across department lines, uh, that is what it's all about. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the answer. I think there are improvements, but I think we need a lot more. Offering home care by government employees is, of course, one great solution. However, being a senior does not mean giving up on running one's own life. Seniors want to stay in charge while receiving the help they need to stay in charge themselves. In particular, they care very much about who helps them. Question to the minister. When will you promote other options for home care instead of rigid and inflexible schemes? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, Mr. Speaker, once again, uh, thank the Honourable Member for the question, and I do agree completely that uh, seniors uh, right across the province, that they want to remain active, that they want to remain mobile, and that is, and as I said before, they want to remain in their own homes, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we have enhanced programs, that we're looking at new programs, uh, respite that I had mentioned, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the Honourable Member uh, reference stated that uh, the home care programs are inflexible and rigid. 
Uh, personally, Mr. Speaker, I would have to disagree with that. I think that we do have flexibility as far as uh, uh, when uh, home care is provided. Uh, there's been additional resources put forward to provide home care respite in the evenings, Mr. Speaker. And you look at the total commitment, financial commitment of this government to home care, 23.4 million, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the recent throw speech, we heard an announcement, and I'll quote, of a microloan program for underrepresented populations that will be established to provide islanders who identify as BIPOC, Indigenous, women, 2SLBGTQIA+, and youth, the necessary assistance to start their own business and chart their own course in life. Mr. Speaker, I've been advocating for a microloan program since 2012 as part of the broader challenge of increasing underrepresented populations in small business and PEI. So, of course, I'm personally really excited to learn more about this new program. Question for the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. When will this fund launch and how much funding is being allocated to it this fiscal year? Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't have that exact number, but it's in the works now, Honourable Member. Uh, I do know that uh, we've been working at it over the last few months. But as well, uh, we're quite possibly going to add more to it because the more communication correspondence we have, we learn more. And uh, I think uh, well, there, there might also be another avenue uh, to help support uh, uh, the community as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. There are existing programs for youth that provide loans and mentoring, including Futurepreneur, which is developed, delivered via Innovation PEI, providing 20, up to 20,000 in loans and mentorship, uh, with an additional 40,000 from BDC for qualified applicants. However, some partnership programs do not allow multiple government funding sources. So a question for the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Is the Futurepreneur program still active within Innovation PEI? And if so, how will this new microloan program work in collaboration with it? The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we've obviously seen gaps uh, uh, before COVID, but COVID has really put a lot to light. So uh, the microloan is, is part of it, but we're also looking at some possible grant system as well um, for, for youth and different organizations. So the department is working on it now. I haven't had the final details on that, uh, and it hasn't been presented to me yet, but I'll go back to them this afternoon and uh, to try and get you an exact date with a little more info of, of what this looks like. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know certainly we have heard from the youth that one of the biggest barriers is a loan-only program is really difficult for them to get into. So that would be very helpful. Um, generally, entrepreneurs, regardless of their demographic or special group that they may belong to, are all, all face similar barriers when it comes to starting a business. Access to capital, and that's seed funding, uh, business planning and mentorship, um, the operational investment on things like accounting and legal supports, insurance, registrations, things that aren't sexy but are really important for that business to succeed, focus and capacity and product market fit. Effective business support programs need to provide more than dollars. They need to provide support, networks, mentoring and community. Question for the same minister. What consultation have you had with the community and what role will community groups have in developing or delivering this new microloan program or other programs like it? Honourable Minister, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I do know the department uh, has been consulting uh, in the past, but they're consulting uh, as we speak right now, and that's where a lot of these programs are, are being designed from the consultation and what they're hearing uh, uh, from the community itself. But also, all the innovations programs over the last six months now, we've been reviewing, uh, finding out where the gaps are to try and simplify, uh, to make them uh, easier to navigate, uh, which I'll have an announcement this afternoon, uh, Mr. Speaker. But uh, one thing that we're trying to do is support all small business the best we can. Um, and by adding more supports and uh, simplifying it, certainly going to help that business community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the challenges when you're developing programs is we want them to be simple, but they also have to address complex needs. 
Um, a simple announcement like a microprogram that's specifically for groups also needs to recognize that these identified underrepresented groups are intersectional. For example, a youth participant could also be a member of the BIPOC community and also be a woman. And a, a woman would also be a member of the queer community and the indigenous community. So that intersectionality becomes really critical when we're designing programs that are actually responsive and are not just a checklist of have we included a list of um, acronyms and groups. A question for the same minister. How will you ensure in your department that this new microloan program and any other programs that you're delivering meet the needs of diverse groups and that they are fair and equitable? The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and consultation is key. Um, I know Charlottetown West Royalty has been a big advocate. Um, I actually had met uh, with the Honourable Member uh, a week and a half ago, yeah. and he uh, brought some great ideas that come from the BIPOC community uh, to help uh, help with the system and some of the, some of the problems that uh, they're facing with business supports as well. Uh, some real good ideas come out of that. I've gone back to the department uh, to see what we can do and what we can look at, and, and uh, the money is there. It's just uh, to be creative and uh, get the best use for it. So uh, consultations going now. I'll go back and, like I say, get an update uh, from my deputy because I know she's been hands-on uh, dealing with the, the community, and I'll, I'll be back with an update just as soon as I have one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For three years in a row, I have raised the issue of inclusion and diversity in the annual Ignition Fund grants at Innovation PEI, so even with the previous administration, let alone this one. For example, about 70% of the annual grants awarded through, through the Ignition Fund in recent years have been awarded to businesses owned only by men. So while the new targeted microloan is hugely important, it won't help if businesses are still being left out of the rest of the offerings that you have in your department. Question for the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Will you be requiring existing innovation PEI business funding programs to apply a diversity and inclusion criteria for a more fair and equitable business community, or will I have to stand up here again next year and ask you the same question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, so when uh, we had talked about uh, the grants and 70% uh, that, that went to men, I went back to the department to find out why. I, I was curious myself because I was surprised at that. And a lot have come down to uh, the applications that, that have come in. So I said, well, what do we need to do to, uh, to open it up, to make more people apply, uh, to make sure women uh, uh, have the, the same uh, equality as men on these programs, as well as the board that reviews them? I want to make sure there's a, a gender balance on that board that approves these as well. So we took that initiative to do that, Mr. Speaker, and I assure you, you won't be up uh, next year, Honourable Member, asking these same questions. Honourable Member from Tignish Pomerov. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions to the Minister of Health. Community care facilities that care for our seniors are strained due to funding and their inability to pay staff competitive wages. Many facilities continue to care for level four patients because government has no beds available in our, in our long-term care facilities or in our hospitals. And it should be noted that these caregivers are doing much more than, than is what is expected of them, such as the additional responsibility of giving up medications. Minister, what is the daily per diem presently paid to our private community care facilities? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, under the Department of Health and Wellness, Mr. Speaker, as I'm sure every honourable member is aware, uh, the inspection of these facilities is carried out by uh, uh, Health and Wellness. With regard to uh, the per diems, Mr. Speaker, that are paid to, these, uh, to the community care homes, uh, that is uh, under social development and housing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The honourable member from Tignish, Palmer Road. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, that throws me off a little bit here, without, but coming from it, because I would just have assumed it came from the Department of Health. Uh, but anyway, that's, we'll shift right over then. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, my question is going to be to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Um, Mr. Mr. Uh, <laughs> Speaker, advocates for community Sorry, care facilities buddy. are saying that staff turnovers are above normal in our island facilities. And in my own community, I'm aware that it's very hard to attract and to, att uh, attract and to retain workers uh, because wages really don't match the responsibilities. Um, so, Minister, what do you think is the appropriate wage for caregivers uh, who help our seniors with daily living? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and this, is, uh, this is an area that's of great concern to me um, as, as a constituent MLA as well. And it, it's, uh, it's something that really needs to be part of our, our whole strategy in, in, uh, in caring for our seniors uh, overall, including at home. And, um, and when it comes to paying people uh, uh, wages for their work uh, in order to attract people to them, um, I'm not going to venture a, a guess here as to the, the appropriate wage uh, on the floor of the legislature, but um, I'd like to go back to the department and, and dig into this more and, and see if we can come up with a, a good uh, solution to this problem, both in the short term and the long term. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tignish Pomerosa, second supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Minister, I really do appreciate that you said you will take this back and that uh, you don't know exactly what the answer is today. But um, I would like to follow up with you on that. And I'd like to push a little bit more. Will you commit today? Um, will you commit to increasing the per diem for uh, community care facilities so that they can pay the caregivers the wages that they deserve? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Uh, well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, of course, the per diem uh, for a community care facility is made up of uh, much more than, than just wages. And that's why it's... Uh, it's, it's an issue that requires closer examination, um, and that's part of it as well. And there's a, there's a lot of factors that go into it, and that, that's why I'm, I'm hesitant to provide any numbers here today. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I will commit to getting back to the member, and then you can come and meet with the department if you like to even discuss it and provide input um, within the within the uh, the next three weeks. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Cornwall and Meadowbanks. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I just want to ask a couple of questions to the Minister of Health about vulnerable islanders. Mr. Speaker, right across this country, as we've seen the last year, that uh, our long-term care systems have failed to meet the basic needs of patients and their families, keeping them safe, comfortable, and well cared for. But we've been very fortunate in Prince Edward Island. But that does not mean that everything's okay, Mr. Speaker, uh, in preparation for possibly another pandemic. And uh, we've seen our most recent study for the cost and demand for elder care is going to double in the next 10 years. We have to be prepared. We've also seen and heard our increased excuses and delays and lack of movement from this government, and time is not on your side. We have an aging demographic, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Health, you have identified a number of priorities in our long-term care system, including staffing, physical resources, and more. What is the holdup for moving this? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the Honourable Member is absolutely uh, correct that, uh, that we have been very fortunate here during this pandemic right across the board, but certainly with our seniors uh, under the great leadership of Dr. Morrison and, uh, and CPHO uh, in response uh, earlier this afternoon to questions uh, from uh, an Honourable Member of the Official Opposition, Mr. Speaker. I did outline a number of initiatives that we have taken in, uh, uh, with response to seniors. We do need to keep our seniors front and centre. They do want to be uh, uh, in, able to stay at home as long as possible, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we will certainly continue with that focus in health and wellness and in our government working across different department lines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Cornwall, Meadowbanks. I totally agree with you. Uh, seniors living at home longer, Minister, but let's put a plan in place. Let's act on maybe some of the weaknesses in the long-term care. We still have patients at the QEH, dementia patients at the QEH. Have you visited Unit 9 at the QEH to see where these dementia patients are actually situated? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'll be uh, right up front. No, I have not had the opportunity to uh, uh, tour any of our facilities at this point. Uh, certainly very familiar with the facilities in the western part of the province, Mr. Speaker. But it certainly it is one of the things that, uh, that I'm looking forward to, uh, to get out, to meet with staff, to see patients, and to see our facilities to get that feedback right from the grassroots, on the ground, the ones that work in those facilities day in and day out. As far as uh, from their perspective as well, Mr. Speaker, where the gaps are, but uh, the Honourable Member also mentions with regard to uh, dementia, and it's one of the things as well, Mr. Speaker, that I had referenced earlier this afternoon in the speech from the throne, and certainly will be coming forward in the budget 
is with regard to funding for dementia, uh, our department, my department, health and wellness as well, with regard to the Alzheimer's Society First Link program, we provide substantial funding there as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Cornwall Metal Banks, your second supplementary. That's, that's good to hear, Minister. I look forward to uh, hearing uh, what you have to say, and I'm sure a lot of, there's a lot of families out there that are looking forward to it. And, uh, but, Mr. Speaker, families, they are getting anxious in long-term care facilities. We know what we went through the last year. Uh, we've had, we had a strike right out here in front of uh, the legislature. Uh, we're seeing other provinces like Nova Scotia. They invested $1.02 billion in long-term care. And uh, while we've seen really no plan here to ensure that if this happens again, that we can make sure that that partner in care can get in and, and treat or you know, touch, hug, feel, whatever, their loved ones, Mr. Speaker, in uh, long-term care facilities. And we haven't seen anything in that regard from this Question. government. Um, with all we have seen over the past year and a half across this country, why is your government still failing to prioritize long-term care spending and action in this province? Why are our most vulnerable yeah. being ignored? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, personally, I really do appreciate where the member is coming from with regard to partners in care, with regard to loved ones who are in long-term care facilities. Uh, you know, at the outset of the pandemic, uh, Mr. Speaker, and continuing on, what has to be the priority of our government, of the different departments within our government, is to keep Islanders safe, to keep our loved ones safe. Has there been a sacrifice uh, that we've all had to make in order to uh, accomplish that, Mr. Speaker? Absolutely, there has been. Uh, as we move forward, though, uh, some of the... Uh, uh, you know, not only during uh, a period of uh, the pandemic of COVID-19, but as we move forward uh, with regard to long-term care, with regard to our seniors, we certainly, Mr. Speaker, have to look at the programs that we have in place, how we can improve upon them, and take it forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for the last number of weeks, the Liberal Caucus has focused on access to health care. Mr. Speaker, a troubling picture is beginning to emerge. We are seeing staff shortages here, lack of resources there, and unfortunately, a government that lacks the planning required to address these issues. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier said in response to questions about the growing health care crisis, and I quote, we have to be honest about the real needs of Islanders the real needs of Islanders. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier believe that 16,573 Islanders without a doctor is a real need? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the need across the board for 159,000 Islanders is access to quality health care services, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we are working to try to provide. Uh, I think what we're trying to do is recognize that, uh, as I said earlier in question period, Mr. Speaker, it's no secret that there's a challenge in uh, our province when it comes to health human resources, Mr. Speaker. We're working hard, like governments before us, to try to address that. We're trying to be creative. We're looking at new ways to do that, to incentivize those to come here and also to retain those who are here, Mr. Speaker. But while we're doing that, trying to add, Mr. Speaker, we're trying to use the full scope of the health care services we have in this province to provide the best care we can for Islanders, Mr. Speaker. It's a difficult file. We're doing the best we can, Mr. Speaker. We're moving the dial forward. Uh, but we know we need to do better, Mr. Speaker, and Islanders deserve quality health care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier believe that he... Excuse me. The Premier also talked about adequate health care. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier believe that he is meeting the adequate health care needs of 16,573 Islanders who do not have a family doctor? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I think if you're asking me or any Premier, are we doing enough, Mr. Speaker, that it would be arrogant and wrong for me to say yes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we need to do better. Uh, we are open to that, Mr. Speaker. We're trying our best to do that. These are difficult uh, challenges, and, and they're complex in scope. Uh, as I say, we're trying to deal with shortages in many aspects of our health care, Mr. Speaker, from a human health uh, resource perspective. 
Uh, and while we go about the process to add to those uh, jobs and to retain those who are in them, Mr. Speaker, we still have an obligation to offer health care across the board to, to Islanders uh, using all of those within the health system and all of the partners that are connected to the system, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we are doing, uh, and uh, Mr. Speaker, but uh, I think that uh, the one reality of this job that we all have as legislators, Mr. Speaker, is that no matter what you do today, you go to bed knowing that it isn't enough, Mr. Speaker, but you wake up the next day trying to do more, uh, and that's what we're trying to do, Mr. Speaker. John, the leader of the third party, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, doing more would be great if there was more done to uh, eliminate some of the 16,000. 573 Islanders without a family doctor. Mr. Speaker, in the Premier's view, what is adequate? How many Islanders is he prepared to leave without a doctor because he wants to be honest about the so-called real needs of Islanders? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, at the risk of sounding like a broken record for those who are out there, but I'm, uh, the government and the Premier are trying to do everything they can to provide health care uh, services for 159,000 Islanders, Mr. Speaker, uh, in a model that can deliver service uh, at a quality level to those as close to their home community as possible, Mr. Speaker. Uh, doctors, uh, family doctors are a big, big component of that, Mr. Speaker, and will be at the centre of that service. Uh, but we're trying to give you, uh, as a Prince Edward Islander, uh, access to quality quality health care service uh, across the board using the fleet of services that we have, Mr. Speaker. It's a difficult job. We're trying to do the best we can, uh, but we go to bed every night knowing we need to do more. Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the City of Charlottetown is currently soliciting public feedback from residents on a proposed West Royalty Transportation Master Plan. It actually deals with a good portion of the district that I represent. Now, among the feedback that I've received from the constituents, specifically in Sherwood, there were concerns about increased traffic flow through their residential neighborhoods, their parks, the school. It was also suggested to me that better transit and active transportation links could help alleviate some of those traffic concerns for the residents. Question of the Minister of Transportation. The province is a funding partner in the public transit service offered in the capital region. How much will the province be investing in, tr in the transit services this year? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, this government is certainly vested in uh, active transportation, as, as we've seen uh, the work on the uh, Hillsborough Bridge currently and along uh, the uh, uh, bypass um, leading out from uh, St. Peter's Road uh, down towards the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Mr. Speaker, those are just two examples of active transportation that we're working hard on. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the budget address, there was uh, $250,000 announced to do a study on, um, on rural transit, Mr. Speaker. That's, that's a, a, another uh, avenue that we're looking at. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, I'd be more than happy to share some more detailed financial information with regards to our investments when we uh, have uh, our budget on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to hearing that as well. Uh, now, of course, the benefits of improved uh, public transit services, there are many. We can improve neighborhood safety, Mr. Speaker. There's improved mobility for residents, students, workers, and, of course, not to mention the environmental benefits. A uh, question of the same, Minister. Uh, transit service is an expensive one to maintain, but it's also a valuable public investment. Is there any consideration given among the various funding partners to enhance the levels of transit service that are offered in the capital region specifically? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, again, there's, there's uh, two, uh, two investments that we currently have uh, with uh, transit here in PI. The first yeah. would be T3, which would be Stratford, Charlottetown, and Cornwall uh, that makes up that uh, component, as well as uh, the County Line Express that uh, has a, a shuttle service between Charlottetown and Summerside and vice versa several times a day. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, the Honourable Member speaks about his district and I just have to look at my own district uh, of, of Stratford and see the, the immense growth that we have. And uh, you know, we do have somewhat of a, a, a car culture uh, in our society that we need to really shift and, uh, and get more ridership uh, within our uh, public transit system. Uh, I know the, uh, the uh, transit systems did take a bit of a hit uh, early on during COVID. Uh, the ridership was down significantly. Uh, we stepped up through our COVID resiliency uh, program and, and made sure that they were still viable and sustainable for that. And Mr. Speaker, we will continue to invest in uh, public transit and active, active transportation in order to achieve our goals in 2030 for uh, net zero. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Charlottetown Winslow, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm glad you uh, bring that to light, uh, Minister, because of course we know that uh, transportation does account for over half the uh, carbon emissions every year. New programs like the recently uh, electric vehicle rebate is a great step to help reducing that. And you also mentioned too that uh, in PEI specifically we are a car culture. So my question to you, Minister, is how is your department going to try to promote public transit and maybe help decrease traffic in these residential areas? The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure. Transportation and infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So the number one way that we can uh, that we can uh, promote it is is to uh, to ensure that uh, the service that is being provided is there when people need it. We we need to look at uh, at the the times, the type of vehicles that we're using, the fees, the routes, uh, and all of these things are being looked at right now in a study that we're doing that uh, will be completed uh, early summer, I believe, towards the end of June. Uh, so our department has engaged a company called uh, WSP Canada Limited, which are experts in this field. So when that report is done, we will be able to make uh, educated decisions with regards to how to increase uh, the, the ridership uh, in our transit system um, uh, by ensuring that we're providing a service that is there for people where they need it, when they need it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's been a lot of public concern regarding land ownership here in PEI and the enforcement of the Lands Protection Act. In a recent appearance before the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability, IREC confirmed that they had heard the public and have acted on founded public complaints. A question to the Minister of Agriculture and Land. As the Minister with jurisdiction over the Lands Protection Act, do you believe that IRAC has invoked its power to investigate land concerns when necessary without being directed by the Minister? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Land. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, I don't like speaking for IRAC. They're an in independent body, Mr. Speaker. But I, I believe they do act uh, appropriately when uh, they have uh, legitimate complaints about uh, land ownership on this island, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's been public concerns voiced about land transactions in southern in the Southern Kings area, and when. Um, when I asked Iraq, have they ever investigated the Great Enlightenment Buddhist Institute or Great Wisdom uh, Buddhist Institute, Iraq said that they, they could neither comment either way. In a recent news article, though, it has been confirmed that there was an invest investigation that spanned three years from 2015 to 2018. Iraq has never released the findings of that report to the, to the organizations that were investigated. This is information that the organizations could use to assist the response to the concerns they face in the community. A question to the minister. The finding of this report could, assess, uh, could assist those uh, that were investigated in their response to the community's concerns. Do you think that, is, that it is fair for the findings of Iraq investigations are not, that they're not being made available to the parties that were in fact investigated? The Honorable Minister of Agriculture and Land. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that's a fair question, Mr. Speaker, but it's also a question that I can't answer because it's, I can't speak for IRAC, Mr. Speaker, but uh, the member from Stratford Mermaid has a point that uh, this group could use that information to, uh, to go forward and uh, how they uh, maintain their companies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Stratford, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, public trust in our institutions is incredibly important. In 2018, the Auditor General conducted a performance audit on IRAC's petroleum pricing process and policies. There were several recommendations made to increase transparency and accountability. Many changes were made as a result of this audit, which will help increase public trust in IRAC and its processes. A question to the Premier. Will you invoke Section 14D of the Audit Act and immediately write to the Auditor General and request a performance audit on the enforcement of the Lands Protection Act by IRAC to ensure that the legislation, including the spirit and intent of the LPA, is being upheld? Honorable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think I would have to take that question under advisement and then report back. Uh, there's a, a lot loaded into that question. It's an important question. I think the minister's talked about Iraq being independent uh, and us trying to navigate that carefully. Um, I, I honestly don't know how to answer that uh, without uh, seeking uh, some more input. So if I could report back uh, at the first of next week, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, question period. <coughs> Mr. 
statements by ministers. The Honorable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, resp Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize April 2nd as World Autism Awareness Day. The goal of World Autism Awareness Day is to increase understanding and acceptance of people with autism and inspire a kinder, more inclusive world. La Journée Mondiale de la Sensibilisation à l'autisme a pour but d'améliorer la compréhension et l'acceptation des personnes atteintes d'autisme et d'inspirer un monde plus aimable et inclusif. Individuals with autism often face bullying and isolation because their unique abilities are misunderstood. For individuals and their families, the world can feel lonely because of a lack of understanding of aut autism spectrum disorder. Mr. Speaker, the Autism Coordination Act was enacted to improve coordination of a government and community autism support services and provide a continuum of services to maximize inclusion. Since that time, we have seen new and expanded programs and more investments to support diagnosis, intervention, and the activities of daily life. I want to take a moment to highlight some of these achievements, Mr. Speaker. They include creating an early intervention team to improve coordination within early intervention supports, increasing wages for special assist needs and autism assistance, adding four FTE autism consultants to public school system, and purchasing new education resources, equipment and materials for intensive behavioral interventions, including iPads for use in the program. Additionally, throughout the pandemic, our school system has made children with exceptional needs a priority, offering respite within our schools last spring and ensuring our classrooms stay open this school year for children and their support team. Mr. Speaker, Health PEI recently announced that the province will soon offer the evidence-based social ABCs program to help children and families with early intervention practices while they wait for diagnosis. Health PEI is also adding an additional child psychologist to its pediatric psychology services to help reduce wait times for diagnosis. This year's budget for education and lifelong learning includes a new, years, new early years autism specialist and additional autism grants to reduce the waitlist for IBI. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce more initiatives today. The province of Prince Edward Island is developing a new webpage to help families navigate the programs and services available for those with autism spectrum disorder. This one-stop location for all autism-related information, programs, and funding will be launched in April. In no nouvelle page web est en cours de la, la d'élaboration afin de faciliter la recherche de renseignements sur l'autisme. Additionally, as of April 1, 2021, school-aged autism funding will cover the cost of therapeutic activities such as equine and music therapy. Les activités telles que la thérapie équine et la musicothérapie seront désormais admissible à l'aide financière pour enfants autistes d'âge scolaire à partir de 1er avril. I'm also pleased to announce a new partnership between Education and Lifelong Learning, Health and Wellness, Health PEI, and the Autism Society of Prince Edward Island to help cover the cost of private autism diagnostic assessments. La La province aidera à couvrir le coût de, des évaluations diagnostiques privées de l'autisme. The Private Autism Assessment Initiative will build upon programs and services that support children and families and help reduce wait times and barriers for accessing supports. To ensure that this program is successful, we'll be, we will be creating an oversight committee in the near future who will work with all stakeholders in the coming months for a full launch in September. Children ages 0 to 5 who have been identified as at risk of autism spectrum disorder and who are currently on the Pediatric Psychology Services waitlist for assessment will be eligible. Mr. Speaker, a confirmed diagnosis is required to access many programs including early years autism services, school-aged autism funding, and accessibility support. Access to these early interventions should occur as quickly as possible when a child's overall prognosis can be most impacted. I want to thank the Minister of Social Development and Housing and the Minister of Health and Wellness and the staff and their departments for the partnerships we have created to support children.
Going forward, we will build on the momentum of our early years intervention to ensure Islanders with autism spectrum disorder and their families have greater support as they transition to adulthood. And Mr. Speaker, before I sit down, I want to give a big shout out to the amazing NGOs who work day to day um, to support our families with autism spectrum disorder. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Are you good? She wasn't quite finished, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> oh, I thought she went down. That's okay. Oh, keep going. I'll finish her up. But <laughs> on a high note in French. Take the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> That's fine. I thought she said that. Je tiens à reconnaître le travail exceptionnel de nos organisations non gouvernementales auprès des insulaires atteints d'autisme. Mr. Speaker, on World Autism Day, my wish is for understanding and a greater sense of community where all Islanders are respected and appreciated for their unique contributions to our island. Mr. Speaker, I hope the members of the Legislative Assembly will join me in recognizing World Autism Day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sorry about that, Minister. Okay. <laughs> the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Et ça, c'est beaucoup d'informations à procéder. Alors, ça va me prendre un peu de temps à regarder tous les différents annonces là. Et c'est très important parce que l'île du Prince Édouard est la province avec le deuxième plus grand nombre de um, diagnostics d'autisme. So PEI is the second high, has the second highest autism rates in the country, second only to Newfoundland. And, and as I just mentioned, that's a whole lot of information to process. And it sounds like there's some, some pretty great things in there. And the thing that sticks out to me the most is probably the simplest, maybe. Um, and that is the web page. That is something that I've heard loud and clear from so many parents who would say if there was just a web page with all of the things in one place because we don't know what there is, we don't know where to look, we don't know where to go. So that is, that is huge, so thank you. That's really great. Um, and as we consider, so on PEI, in PEI, we have one in 59 people diagnosed with, uh, with autism. And Mr. Speaker, if we look to Port of Bass, Newfoundland, they've been named by today's parent magazine as the most autism-friendly town in Canada. And it's something that um, I've been meaning to, to have a deeper conversation with the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, because we have a, a pretty big opportunity in PEI connecting autism to, um, to tourism. And, and so they have different areas diff in their hotel um, where they make special accommodations to accommodate those living with autism. And even in restaurants, and as we know, Sobeys here turns down the music, they don't make announcements. And so they do things like that and, and they're becoming well known. And um, two women in, in Port of Bass, Newfoundland took it into their own hands, much like here in PEI, where we had two parents of children living with autism who started um, Stars for Life. And um, the former Minister of Education was on the National Autism Strategy call with me where we saw that and we heard that PEI is seen as the lighthouse for autism services. And it's hard to hear that sometimes when you have so many people contacting you about concerns they have. And, but to recognize that the services we have are good and they're solid, we just need more of them. So we've got the right idea, we just need to support and, and fund those. Um, and uh, so, Mr. Speaker, as, as I said before, I'm not going to get into all of the different announcements because I, I, it was hard to keep up. But, and I hope that with, with all of these announcements that as we consider wait times not only for autism diagnosis but for all of the other services that we need, I hope that that's a part of it. Early intervention and prevention matters, Mr. Speaker, and this is an important announcement. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for this announcement. This is wonderful, and, and your announcement about a web page for what's available to parents with uh, children with autism is just wonderful. Mr. Speaker, as was mentioned, Friday, April 2nd, is uh, World Autism Day. And Mr. Speaker, one, Mr. Speaker, many people on PEI are affected by autism, and many families are. This will be the 14th year that we have celebrated and recognized World Autism Day. And every year it is more and more impressive to see the number of participants and jurisdictions coming together to celebrate those living with autism and those who, lo those who love and care for them. 
World Autism Day brings individual autism organizations together around the world to aid in things like research, diagnosis, treatment, and acceptance for those with a developmental path affecting by, affected by autism. Mr. Speaker, people living with autism deserve our kindness, respect, and patience. Let's make sure that we, as legislators, come together to recognize the work that has been done and the work that remains to support those living with autism and their families. And I thank the amazing people that work in this field. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Mr. Speaker, our department is always thinking of ways we can better support our island businesses. Last year, we made a commitment to do a review of our innovation programs. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to rise here today to share that the review of our programs is complete. And starting tomorrow, April 1st, we'll be launching four new innovation PEI programs. These programs are Equity Investors Incentive to provide strategic sector businesses with a tool to attract private sector investment. Innovation Fund to assist businesses to bring a new product, service or process to the market. Small Business Assistance to increase support to small businesses that serve the local market and strategic improvement assistance to improve productivity and competitiveness in the global market. Mr. Speaker, also as part of the review, we decreased our number of programs and increased simplicity by blending business supports into fewer programs. Revisions were also made to some of the current innovation PEI programs, such as increasing our capital acquisition assistance program from $10,000 to $25,000. Starting tomorrow, the four new programs and revisions to the other programs will be updated on Innovation PEI's website, www.innovationpei.com. I want to thank everyone that was involved in the review of our programs and for their help in creating new ones, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the official opposition and the third party for your input and ideas towards these programs. Mr. Speaker, our hope with these changes is that it will be easier for island businesses to navigate, understand, and apply to our innovation PEI programs, and ultimately, that they will be better serve the needs of our island businesses. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I know we say that it's a pleasure to rise on a regular basis, but I really mean it. <laughs> um, and I mean it because um, as I've spoken about a number of times before, pr prior to entering this house, I worked ex explicitly with small businesses and businesses that, that were starting up scaling, not just in PEI, but across Canada. But in PEI, we had the wealth of programs, but often not a fit to what businesses actually needed. And some of that is just what happens when you have programs that roll out over time. They build up and we add new ones. We don't take that time to be able to rethink and look at, do these still meet the needs of businesses? It's rare that government takes a critical look at the businesses and services that they provide and the programs and services they provide and say, you know, we can do better with these. And sometimes that means that we will stop doing something or, um, you know, look at whether it, 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 it could be better by improved by ceasing it or rolling it into something else. Um, and, I, and it is really encouraging to see that that happened with consultation with the community, with, with uh, small business owners and operators from across the province, and as you said, with um, others, including myself and my, my colleague from Cornwall Meadowbank, um, who could bring the, the, our, our perspectives and experience both as small business owners and operators as well. So the, I am really um, grateful that the, the commitment has been followed up on in this case, not just because those funds remain available, but the key in this one is simplicity. And as we just heard about, you know, with a program that's completely unrelated, but has one of those same key components, sometimes we forget that one of the hardest things for people who, who want to connect and engage with government is knowing what question to ask. We hear that from parents with autism was, I didn't know that I didn't know that there was this program that was here for me because I didn't ask the right question. Um, and that's the same thing for people who are thinking about starting a business. It's really hard. There is so much to do. And often people get tripped up or miss out on opportunities because they just didn't know what to ask. So that simplicity is really important to make sure that everybody has the same opportunity to be able to, to get the best possible start that they can. So i um, really excited to be able to support this. Um, I'm saying excited a lot today. It's one of those days. So, um, but when it comes to seeing more opportunities for small businesses to survive and thrive and grow in PEI, then it's always good news. Thank you, Minister, for this, and I look forward to working again in you in the future. 
Honorable member from Cornwall Metal Banks, third party house leader. I wasn't choking on the good news, Mr. Speaker, but it is, it is really good news. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know what, uh, I worked in, in that field as well, uh, along with that portfolio, and I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of days you shake your head and say, which program is that? Which one is that again? And it is difficult, but uh, anytime we can help small businesses, especially right now, um, I think, you know, we've done promotions on buy local, shop local, and uh, we're, what we're seeing on e-commerce platforms, it's getting tougher and tougher for small businesses uh, to be successful. Uh, but it also is it's giving opportunities as well, and programs that the Minister has mentioned, especially the equity and innovation one and strategic improvement, I think uh, many small businesses can take advantage of that and new businesses. And, it's, it's easy. Uh, PEI is built in small business. So after our primary sectors of fishing and farming, uh, if we take small business out of that equation, there's not a lot left in Prince Edward Island. So it's certainly an important uh, issue, and I commend the minister and his department. Thank you. End of ministers by statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of Documents. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I beg leave to table. Oh, excuse me. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table documents uh, related to the fight request we had for information on policies, procedures, methodologies, and decision-making tools used to decide which roads will be paved. And I move, seconded by the member from Mermaid Stratford, that the, 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 the document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carry, carry. Thank you. <coughs> The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, uh, by leave of this House, I beg to table a uh, response to a written question that I referred to earlier today. I move, seconded by the um, Finance Minister and Deputy Premier, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carried. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, re Minister responsible for the status of women. Mr. Speaker, by command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg to leave table the 2018-2019 Department of Education, Early Learning and Culture Annual Report for the period ending March 31st, to March 31st 2019. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Did yeah. I miss anyone? No? Reports by committees. Introduction of government bills. Motions other than government. Motions other than government? The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce the bill to be entitled the Poverty Elimination Strategy Act, and I move, <coughs> seconded by the Leader of the Official Opposition, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall I carry? Yeah, yeah. Doing wrong bills. Bill number 107, Poverty Elimination Strategy Act, read a first time. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill provides a legislative framework for the creation of a long-term strategy that leads to the elimination of poverty in PEI. It encompasses accountability and ministerial responsibility, coordination, engagement and reporting requirements, and measures and targets for the reduction and elimination of poverty, food insecurity, and chronic homelessness in Prince Edward Island. Thank you. Orders other than government, the Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Leader of the Official Opposition that Order 24 be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. Order 24, an act to amend the Health Services Act, Bill Number 106, in committee. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Leader of the Official Opposition that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall I carry? Carry. The Honourable Member from Tignesh Palmerow, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the bill to be intitulated an act to amend the Health Services Act. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Granted. Thank you. State your name and position for Hansard. Dr. Michelle Patterson, Research and Communications Officer for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much and welcome. Um, honorable members, we left yesterday. Um, it, it was open for questions and uh, we are still debating this bill. So I will start again with a new list um, of anyone who wants to ask any questions. So the floor is now open. No questions? Shall the bill carry? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Chair. You know, uh, with questions that I put forward uh, yesterday, and again, thank uh, the Honourable Member for bringing uh, this piece of legislation forward. But just uh, a couple of comments that, uh, that I would like to make in conclusion and uh, start off with, uh, with a fairly general question uh, to the promoter of the bill. With regard to the delivery of health care services in the province of PEI, under the current governance model, the long and the short is there is one and only one person who is elected by the people of Prince Edward Island who is accountable directly to the people of Prince Edward Island, and that is whoever is sitting in the minister's chair. Do you agree with that? So uh, thank you. Well, I guess that's a it's an interesting question, Minister. I will uh, point out that, uh, of course, there is you are there is a Minister of Health. Um, when we talk about good governance, though, we talk about what are the best uh, ways to ensure that our system is working toward the best health, health outcomes for Islanders. And that really needs to be the priority uh, in how we are um, uh, organizing our systems and ensuring we are working toward uh, the best governance possible. So uh, there are still many components uh, of our healthcare system that, uh, and of Health PEI that really are, will still be under the uh, direct purview of the minister. So we talked about the strategic plan, we talked about uh, budget, we talked about uh, the business plan. Um, what the role is of Health PEI, of the board, is to uh, oper operationalize those plans. Uh, so I'm not sure in what way your question uh, directly relates to these amendments around good governance, um, so I, I suppose that's perhaps the, the best answer I can give to that. No, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, pretty well, just a flat uh, yes or no answer mm -hmm. is if the only person who is actually elected by the people, the taxpayers of Prince Edward Island, with regard to the health care uh, system, with regard to delivery of health care services is whoever may be sitting in the minister's chair. And I think that we would all have to agree uh, that the answer to that is yes. Uh, one other uh, point or question I would like to uh, uh, bring forward. Uh, the amendments that were brought forward back in 2018, mm -hmm. just wondering if, uh, and we did talk yesterday about who you would consult it with uh, in the preparation of this piece of legislation, but the amendments that were brought forward in 2018, who did you speak with with regard to the impact, positive or negative, of those amendments? Other than over and above, was there anybody over and above the ones that you had indicated uh, as far as consultation? Uh, thank you. So we, we did also have um, a call for public input um, uh, that we uh, received uh, five submissions uh, as well as some you know comments on social media where we also shared that uh, 
open call for public input. So, um, you know, through that process, we had some questions, uh, but generally there was uh, support again for um, for these amendments. I will also uh, just going back to the first part of your question. Um, I just want to highlight that uh, what we currently have is a health authority and health PEI that does have a board. Um, uh, these amendments are not a complete restructuring of that system, which it sounds like is what the minister is um, describing or alluding to in which um, the responsibilities for all health services on PEI would be placed completely under the department and the minister. Um, that is a conversation perhaps that could be had another day and would require a, a complete overhaul of the system. That is not the system that we have currently. Um, what we are trying to do here is work with the system that we have, which is with Health PEI as a, a health authority that has a board and ensure that the governance structure of the system that we do have is as effective and appropriate as possible. So it will work uh, for the long-term health care outcomes of Islanders and ensure that our health care providers are able to, uh, to work effectively and in a uh, comfortable, comfortable and confident manner that their work is going to be uh, predictable and that they're going to know what the plans are moving forward without last minute changes uh, that uh, the minister alone would be able to make. So, you know, we're not talking about a complete overhaul of the system here. Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, uh, you know, just a couple of wrap-up comments that I would have here is uh, the promoter mentions feedback on social media. I have a concern of drafting legislation. Personally, I have a concern putting forward legislation that's based on social media feedback. <laughs> Uh, we look at the collaboration that no the collaboration that I had put forward asked yesterday, and the feedback that was received was minimal at best. Uh, there was a jurisdictional scan that was carried out, which I do appreciate. Uh, the promoter had uh, referenced best practices. Well, uh, you look at uh, certainly there's a variation across jurisdictions, and the way that the governance model is structured in various jurisdictions, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sure each of those jurisdictions continually uh, review, but having said that, what may be considered by one jurisdiction uh, is, as, a, as their best practice is going to be different than what is considered the best practice in another uh, jurisdiction. Uh, we had mentioned yesterday uh, uh, but there was only two, I believe, that the promoter had indicated. Uh, but actually, uh, the information that I have and have been provided with is that there's four, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, Nunavut, and Alberta, and uh, similarly uh, in New Brunswick. But anyway, those are for at least at this point, Mr. Uh, and Chair, my closing comments. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I will just say, I, I suppose it depends on how you are interpreting that legislation, but uh, the comment on social media, I could see your concern if that was the only consultation that we did, uh, as you noted, criticism and other uses of social media, if that's the only outreach that's done, that is a problem. I would agree with you. Of course, that's not the case uh, in this bill. Um, uh, I also want to... Um, Note that again, uh, these are the changes in this bill are simply repealing what was put forward in 2018. So, uh, other than uh, keeping the uh, east and west representation, um, I've not uh, gone beyond what those changes were. So, um, you know, if we look back at the consultation that happened at that time. Uh, Again, I will note that the only consultation that took place was with the board at that time, and the board at that time said, no, this is not a good idea, we do not want <laughs> these changes, and then they all resigned once that the changes passed. So if consultation is the concern, and I can't stress this enough, that is absolutely uh, a reason to support this bill. Thank you. Well, Larry and Vernesse. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Yeah, I kind of want to weigh in some of the debate in this, and it's one of these ones that, from a, as a former Minister of Health, and I've dealt with under the previous, previous board situation, and uh, and then, you know, the 
the next minister made some changes uh, to the to the act. Like I always look at this as a as a, as a minister of health. If there's always the tug and pull between a board and uh, and the minister, mm -hmm. if if it's too much to all board operational mm -hmm. sides of things, you know, you get into issues about money. Uh, boards might want to do something; they might want to consolidate services that may not be uh, in the best interest of Islanders or in certain regions. And I think a minister always has to try to find that balance on uh, on how they do that and how they uh, deal with the services. I would say from my time and, you know, the board that uh, was there when, when I was there, you know, there was a pretty good relationship uh, that, that we had. And, uh, but th these were the challenges that you were always faced with. As a minister, you, you're handed an envelope of money. It's like a budget, mm -hmm. <laughs> we call it. And, uh, you know, the Minister of Finance is always sort of allocating, in, in my opinion, it's always a little less money than you'd want. Every minister will go through that same, you know, I've went through three different That's portfolios. <laughs> and it's always tough. And uh, when you have a board that's able to make those types of, uh, you know, that's not their, they're focused on the delivery of service, not mm -hmm. so much on the budget. Mm -hmm. And that's where you run into this tug and pull between issues around uh, consolidating of services. You, you could probably close all our community hospitals and uh, you could, uh, you know, consolidate everything and that's probably more cost efficient. But it's not where islanders want to get their services. It's not. It's not the way, I, in my opinion, where Islanders want to go with health care. I, I was a big advocate for the hospital in Larry and making sure that it provided the service. I think the key is that we just don't duplicate services in all these facilities. We make use of them. So I'm kind of caught in that uh, dichotomy, I guess, of saying that your bill has some merits. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, a, a morphing of the current uh, legislation of the way the structure goes to what was before. It's kind of an in-between there. And from that perspective, I sort of... Uh, support that. But what what processes do you have, uh, member, when it comes to the issues of these types of conflicts that you're going to run into between the minister and the board? Is there any concept of a conflict resolution process that's going to be within the legislation uh, that will help in maybe dealing with these types of potential board dysfunctions? Because I know that the next minister after me did have struggles with the board. There was new board members, personalities come forward that, that uh, change. You know, and and you don't know what the mandate of each person when they get on the board, what their thoughts are, and, and their philosophies sometimes in healthcare. So you're always. So do you have any sense of how that would unfold? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, thank you for this uh, question, honourable member. Uh, first of all, um, I mean, I would honestly be you know more concerned about. Uh, you know, sort of what you described as more extreme or drastic, you know, changes to the system uh, occurring uh, from one person, one minister having that power, uh, rather than a board of seven to 11 uh, Islanders representative from across the province, including guaranteed representation from the East and West. So I think that that weighing that, uh, you know, the, the concern is, is much more with one person having that uh, power. Um, but it is, you're right, it is work. Um, you yes. know, I think if, if anybody, uh, you know, took the job of health minister expecting uh, that it would be an easy one or that they would, you know, be getting out of work, it is, you know, <laughs> they will be surprised. It is It is most certainly a difficult job and, uh, and one that requires work. And some of that work, part of it is building relationships and working with people like the board, um, you know, to, uh, to work toward, again, the best health, health outcomes for Islanders. So some of that responsibility is on the minister. And one of the formal ways that responsibility um, is on the minister in this act, which will still be there, is the uh, the ability to create an accountability framework. Now, this was actually something that um, came up when the changes happened in 2018. Um, and there was a guarantee that, OK, these changes are going to disrupt the structure, but we will have an accountability framework right away. That was the promise. Um, and it hasn't happened. And it hasn't happened with the current government. It's, it's still in flux. So um, creating that accountability framework that clearly outlines, uh, you know, who is responsible for what and what the, the, those relationships look like is an excellent way to uh, to uh, to build that relationship effectively and, and mitigate some of those concerns. Uh, Michelle, is there anything else? No. Okay. All area Inverness. See, the, there's one. It's sort of the same issue that we're dealing with with the Island Regulatory's Appeal Commission issue that, you know, <laughs> that we're trying to find out, you know, wh where's that balance on it? Because once again, from my experience, when it came to these tough issues that you'd be making within the healthcare system, 
the one person that always had to be accountable in the end was the minister. Mm -hmm. He was the one that, or she or she, was the mm -hmm. one that had to sit on the floor of the legislature, answer all the questions, and, and I'll say it's a bit of a cop-out to say that, uh, well, that's a board decision, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, uh, I don't have to answer that, and this is what we see sometimes with issues around Iraq, as an mm -hmm. example. So, so, I mean, and I'm a big believer that there needs to be accountability by the minister, and the, and the public gets accountability through the democratic process by electing the people here to, to, to provide that sense of criticism. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I kind of go back to saying the minister's making that ultimate, or should be making the ultimate decision, but a board is there and, and there's that always that tug and pull between the two of them. Um, so like I say, I fundamentally believe in a board and it's mm -hmm. good to have that feedback coming from a board, but I also feel that there needs to be support from the minister mm -hmm. uh, in they're the ones that have to answer the questions. They are the ones that are always in front of uh, the mm -hmm. rallies, <laughs> the protests, uh, from my experience anyway, never would see a board member anywhere near me. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, you know, so when the tomatoes are coming, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the board minister that has to, to, to deal with that. Uh, like I say, so I, I generally I really fundamentally believe that there needs to be some board and structure, uh, but, uh, you know, the and, and I, I like the way you're kind of thinking about the legislation. I, I mm -hmm. sort of see it as a bit of a morphing of the two. I, I don't think it's any more of a better solution to health care delivery than no board or a, a full board. It, it, like, at the end of the day, these are all tough decisions and they're all financially driven in many ways. Um, but uh, but I think, uh, so, so what's your thoughts on that mm -hmm. as far as... Uh, you know, like, like I say, I do find it a bit odd that, you know, your party seems to be thinking one way when it comes to uh, the Iraq issue and then a, a different way this way. It's you're kind of picking and choosing your spots there. But uh, Well, in regards to this legislation, um, I do want to... Uh, so, so thank you for the, for the questions and the <laughs> comments, first of all. I think that, uh, again, the job of the minister is difficult, and yes, uh, the minister is the one that is the public face and does have to answer those questions. But the, the goal in um, creating legislation around our health care system is not to um, ensure that the minister's job is as easy as possible. Um, uh, quite honestly, you know, that building that effective relationship between the board and the minister um, is, is part of that job. And the better that relationship is, the, the easier it will be for the minister to be the front face of what's happening. Um, I want to just touch on the idea of leadership. So, you know, really, it takes strong leadership, uh, you know, to 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 for this file. I mean, it's co it's a complex one, and, and you know, the member knows that oh. very well. <laughs> um, uh, but when we think about leadership, you know, leadership is not about um, holding on to or taking hold of every last bit of power you can possibly get a hold of. It's about building those relationships and uh, and and effective communication and leading with you know integrity and respect um, and that's really what you know it does require more work but uh, that is the expectation of someone who is holding the role of health minister and when we look at what is going to be the best system to move us toward uh, the best healthcare outcomes for Islanders. It is one in which the board can make decisions based on evidence, working with the healthcare professionals and health PEI, working toward long-term outcomes without disruption in plans that are evidence-based. I have an intervention from the Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, no, it was more uh, a comment, and I do appreciate uh, uh, the Honourable Member bringing up with regard, as well as the promoter, uh, the building of relationships uh, with the board. Uh, uh, the afternoon after I was sworn in as Minister of Health, uh, the first meeting that I had was with the chair and with the board. So that there, and the, like the complete board of, uh, of directors. And I do agree, like it's extremely important to have that uh, that representation from right across PEI, right uh, west to east. Uh, it has been mentioned here with regard to the accountability framework. Uh, that is one thing that, uh, and I was so happy to see it, a draft of that mm -hmm. at that very first meeting, which is still being finalized, but to see that that is moving forward mm -hmm. and is going to be, you know, in place very soon. But uh, it comes down, I guess, uh, to me, I think that there's so many different, as the members of the critic certainly appreciates, and I appreciate your comments, uh, as uh, the honorable member from uh, O'Leary Inverness, uh, former uh, health minister himself. 
Uh, is it challenging? Without a doubt, it is. But I think at the end of the day, like certainly we're all here for the best interests, with the best interests of uh, PEI at heart. I think too, though, we look at, uh, at prior to uh, 2018, what was the governance system then prior to uh, uh, the act that was put in place back in, uh, I believe it was proclaimed in late 2009, the different uh, governance system structure that was in place right across the province. But I do think it is extremely important to, uh, to maintain the powers, and I don't want that to sound in any way negative connotations with regard to, uh, to powers, but uh, the powers of the accountability that the minister does require and I think at the end of the day, too, you look uh, uh, the Honourable Member for Malaria Inverness uh, referenced himself that uh, where there's some, for whatever reasons, where there's some conflicts prior to 2018, there were, without a doubt. I think everybody here would, uh, would agree with that. But anyway, uh, overall, Mr. Chair, no uh, specific question. I did just want to acknowledge that I do agree it's a building of relationships. You do need that to take place. One of the reasons that the first meeting I hit after being sworn in was to make that connection and just to reiterate the accountability framework, the progress, substantial progress that has been and continues to be made on that. So with that, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, yes, and I uh, thank you for those uh, comments, Minister. Um, I do, uh, I want to note that uh, it's it's very easy, um, I think, to say that we shouldn't be talking about power. Let's not let's not talk about power when uh, you know it is one who is, is holding all the power in the situation can say that. Um, uh, I think that if we are really looking at this from a lens of what is going to be the best system that is going to result in the best health outcomes for Islanders, um, that these amendments are the the right way to go. And I think. You know, there's a real opportunity here to be brave and uh, to take that step to say that, you know, this government is prepared and able to lead in a way that is not with uh, a heavy hand, but that is through collaboration. And uh, I think that that's, that's a message that uh, we uh, can all agree is, is something that we've, we uh, would like to see. So. Olary Inverness. Yeah, no, I appreciate the member uh, the, the views, and, and I said I'm, I'm generally supportive of your of your bill here because, like I say, I've, I've sort of seen it from both sides of it, and I, I see some strengths in in it in, in many ways. But on the other side of it, I think we, it would be a very utopian view to think that this would make healthcare a better structure because I, I don't know if there's one model or system that is going to make it better. Uh, it would be slightly better probably, and it does create a little more of a democratic process in in your boards. And I I, I I'd say I do believe boards are there from advice perspective and if you can have some process uh, that ever with the governing party is at the time can deal with the issues around the potential conflict resolution when it comes to those challenges that boards and I've seen that with my you know my the member that took over for me after you know the, it, there was there was more issues that it seemed to be with the board and I and I've seen it myself with the uh, issues and, and the Minister of Health would understand you know, my time as minister, I remember trying to get uh, one little service added to the O'Leary Hospital. It was uh, the ambulatory uh, care nurse to, based out of the O'Leary Hospital and the health PI and the board. Oh, that's a waste of money. It's not going to be valued and things of that nature. Uh, that's been operational now for, what, two, three years, and it's just been swamped with work. <laughs> and, you know, so, so it's not always that the board and the you're bureaucrats, little, but you're going to support this. you know, get that, that they always get it right, you know. So, I mean, but, it, but it's, hey, you got to deal with that conflict resolution concept and how you can do that. So, but I, like I said, there, there will there will be no model here that's going to work one way better than the other. But I say in general, I, I see this as, as a chance of more democratic process within the system. So. That's it for me. Yeah. yeah no, thank you. And I, uh, um, I, I, I mean, I don't think I've ever, I, I've never suggested that this will solve all of the issues in our no. healthcare system. Uh, wouldn't that be an incredible thing? Well. <laughs> but, on water. Uh, but it is, oh, as you, yes. yeah, as you note, it, it is, you know, a, a small step uh, that could, that will result in in some improvement and in better accountability and uh, an improved governance model. So, um, when we have the opportunity to take those small steps, I, I do believe we should take them and. Uh, um, that's why I've, I've put this forward. 
Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honourable Member, for bringing this forward. It's been a really interesting discussion. And um, I am not uh, a student of political science. I came to this job, as you know, through another avenue. Uh, but I've done a, an awful lot of reading on, on how our constitutional monarchy works. And that division between, that messy division between um, the executive branch of government and the civil service. And it's, uh, I'm still learning. I'm still learning a lot. Me too. <laughs> but as I understand it, and I want to go, I think it's important for some context that we do go back to really what you're trying to recreate here, which was the legislation as it existed before that amendment was made a couple of years ago, which was when we had a largely independent autonomous board um, populated by experts in the field. I mean, when I, I think of Alex Macbeth and Jim Bravel and um, in my own uh, district, Kay Lewis, huge experience in what it takes to run a healthcare system. Uh, that we removed their authority and autonomy. Um, and I, I think the issue was, I don't, I don't know all of the ins and outs, but I understand the issue was regarding the replacement for the CEO of Health PEI, and that the board made certain recommendations, and that it was at that point that the amendment to the existing legislation was brought forward. In essence, the minister of the time overruling the recommendations of an independent board. And that's the fear that I have for the future here, is mm -hmm. that those boards are independent for a reason. And a, a political mentor of mine once said that as a minister of the crown, you should have, and this is the phrase that she used, she said, you should have your nose in and your fingers out. And I need to explain a little bit what, what she meant by that because I had, to, I had to ask for some, some clarification. She said, it's absolutely critical that you, as Minister of the Crown and ultimately responsible for the decisions of your department, know what's going on. So you have to have your nose in there smelling what's going on. But you cannot be micromanaging. You cannot have your fingers in every decision that is made. And that is why we need autonomous, independent boards. We have them at IIDI, we have them at Innovation PEI, we have them in the education system. They are throughout government for very good reason. Um, and I, I guess my question to you is, do you share the concern I have that this loss of an expert, independent, autonomous board is going to introduce more politicization into some of the decisions that may happen in, in health PEI and the department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's certainly a concern, uh, and and one of the reasons, main reasons that I, I wanted to bring this uh, legislation forward. Um, when we have a, a board that, as you, as you note, uh, is, is made up of uh, experts in the field from across the island, and that's right in the legislation that, we sh that you know, the, it should be those who have um, expert uh, you know, ex uh, knowledge. That's not the right language. Perhaps uh, we can get the language. But in, in the areas of healthcare, um, you know, they're working together with the healthcare professionals to make decisions uh, based on evidence and the long-term uh, outcomes for our healthcare system. Um, so when there is, um, uh, when the minister has the ability to step in and and, and make any changes at any time um, that uh, the minister sees fit, it really does throw sort of a, a you know a chaos factor into that mix that uh, is 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 unpredictable and is uh, you know there's no requirement that it be uh, you know based on evidence or that we're that that be uh, expert opinion. So, um, yes, I, it is, it, it, the long and short of that is, yes, I am concerned about, uh, about the current structure and that uh, I believe this, is, uh, this bill would uh, address uh, some serious uh, issues that we have in terms of good governance. And uh, do you have the quote or the reference there, Michelle, of uh, what the language uh, is around? The, uh, the board members mm -hmm. shall possess the skills, knowledge, experience, and competencies <laughs> determined by the minister as necessary to ensure the effective governance of health PEI. <coughs> Go. Leader of the opposition. Sorry, could you just read that again, Sir. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
The member shall possess the skills, knowledge, experience, and competencies determined by the Minister as necessary to ensure the effective governance of health PEI. So it's actually, you know, interesting because there is another example of where the minister still does have a considerable amount of authority here as well, um, uh, even without, uh, you know, with these changes. So we'll note that. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. Uh, it's been stated in a number of ways about the tension that exists when you have an independent board and you have a minister mm -hmm. uh, and a department as if that tension is somehow problematic, but it's exactly in that tension that good governance, the, 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 the collision of those of that tension provides the spark for good governance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it was, I'm sure it was Churchill who said, democracy is the worst form of govern, governance uh, uh, ever conceived, except all of those that, all of those others that have been tried. Mm -hmm. It's messy. Democracy is incredibly messy, as it should be. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think I would disagree completely with the member from O'Leary and Burness who suggests that our position on Iraq is somehow contradictory to our position here. I think there's a great consistency there where the independence of Iraq and the, and the, the importance of that independence free of political interference is exactly in alignment with our position here, which is to create a board which is free as much as it can be from political interference. So I... Um, whether we're talking about the paving of roads, whether we're talking about land purchase decisions, or whether we're talking about here the operationalizing of health policy, I think that independence from the minister is a critical aspect um, of, of, what, of what is good governance. I'll finish my thought. I understand that we're at the end of time here. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to make that point that democracy is messy and it's and, and as it should be, it's difficult. Um, and that when expertise lies in a board, we as politicians are generalists. We have to be. We cannot be experts in all things. And we rely on experts in the civil service to guide us. Absolutely, the politicians provide the vision and the direction, but we rely on experts to operationalize that vision and that direction. And I think that's what this piece of legislation is trying to do. I'll stop now, Chair. I know we're all over Thank time. You. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, uh, as uh, prearranged, we're going to move over to um, third party time. Um, but Close I'll get the promoter to begin debate. Certainly. Um, I move the speaker take the chair and the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall carry? Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Health Services Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Member from Cornwall, Meadowbank, Meadowbanks, the third party House Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we call motion 33. Shall I carry? Yeah, yeah. There's a difference. <laughs> the member for O'Leary and Burness moves, seconded by the member for Charlton West Royalty, the following motion. Whereas there are now more than 16,000 islanders on the patient registry waiting for access to a family doctor. And whereas this access crisis is now much worse than the situation in both Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And whereas the Conservatives have now abandoned a long-standing social goal to always aim to provide a doctor for every islander. And whereas the goal of a doctor for every islander may be difficult to achieve, it should always be our target as a province. 
and whereas the abandonment of an ambitious goal is the first step towards compromise and the weakening of commitment to health care access, and whereas government appears to be attracted to untested compromises, delays, and accusations that concern that concerns about the growing island doctor shortage are rooted in politics rather than a long-held concern for the health and well-being of islanders. And whereas it is exceedingly important for government to embr embrace basic goals that truly reflect the, the needs of our island society. Therefore, be resolved that this House endorse the long-standing goal of providing a doctor for every islander and continue to make efforts in constant pursuit of this ideal result. I'll call on the mover of the motion, the Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness, third party whip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it does give me uh, great pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, speak on this particular motion. As, as you're well aware, Mr. Speaker, as a former Minister of Health, and uh, based on the line of uh, uh, questioning that uh, I've put forward in this legislature to this current government regarding some of the challenges in health care, um, you know, I feel it's important to uh, bring forward a motion that gives, gives at least me and, and our members and other members in this legislature to weigh in on the issues and challenges uh, uh, and viewpoints that we have on the delivery of health care in this uh, province, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Uh, I certainly have felt that there have been many uh, answers that haven't been uh, forthcoming uh, by this government. I think of questions in trying to find out the amount of uh, physician vacancies at the Prince County Hospital, uh, although uh, that, was, that question was a couple of days ago, still do not have the answers on that. And I do find that a very uh, troubling uh, perspective, Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Health actually is from the Prince County area, and I know my time as Minister of Health I knew exactly the amount of vacancies uh, on a daily basis that were available within that Prince County region because it was my friends, neighbors, constituents that were always coming forward, Mr. Speaker, and asking me, you know, I can't get an appointment and some of the challenges that are out there. So, so I was always very aware of those situations. And, I, and I'm not saying as a Minister of Health that I didn't, wasn't aware as much as maybe other parts of the island, but, but the reality is, is that, you know, you do tend to be more in tune with what, what you know the most. And, the people that you talk to the most, and you do tend to uh, be more uh, up on those types of issues. So that's why I'm a little troubled that the minister didn't seem to uh, be able to provide some of those answers, Mr. Speaker. And, and I found that the government uh, certainly is great at telling stories. It always has the, the rational reason uh, for some, some uh, reason why it made a decision. But I find that those, uh, it, it's not about telling the story, Mr. Speaker. I like to listen to stories, but I like to uh, listen to stories from my constituents and know those stories are factual and actual and they're real life and they and they matter to people mr speaker so so when i uh got word that uh, you know the premier in, in his uh, delivery of the state of the province address and he had abandoned the pledge uh, to obtain a doctor for every islander this has raised some serious questions mr speaker and as a former minister of health i understand the complications of that there's lots of issues that, uh, you know, the doctor has always been in Canada under the Canadian Health Act. It's always been sort of the, the pinnacle position in the uh, health care uh, pyramid. And uh, that comes from factors that, that pertain to issues around accreditation, the, the delivery of services and who does these services. We, we are going to go through an accreditation process. You do it every so many years, depending on how good you did on the, the previous uh, accreditation Review it could be in a two-year time, could be five years, could be you know uh, maybe even bit beyond that, Mr. Speaker. So, so that's that's one factor that always comes into the play on this. And the other big issue is liability, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you're always uh, when you're a minister of health, you're always trying to implement policies and have the right people providing the right level of service. Because if somebody gets it wrong, Mr. Speaker. There's liability issues that come into question. We are dealing with people's health. We're dealing with loved ones, family members, things of that nature. So it's extremely important that, uh, that we are having the right people deliver these services. And that's why I find it very difficult to get the information I'm trying to find out as, as, a, as a, a critic of health care. When the Premier and the Minister of Health have announced things, at first it was the health care hubs. You might recall, Mr. Speaker, I was pretty adamant of trying to find out what these hubs are. 
what do they look like? Is it a building? Is it people around it? And, and I'm a believer that health care isn't delivered by the bricks and mortar of the building, Mr. Speaker. It is delivered by the, the professional hands and technology that uh, they have at their disposal to, uh, to uh, help deal with the health uh, reality that an individual might have. And uh, so that's very important. So as we never really got much clarity to what the hubs were, the next throne speech comes out, and now it's called homes. Yeah. Health homes. Now, when I was a minister, we called them health centers. You know, so hubs gone, homes in. Uh, you know, uh, these these are things that uh, now have raised another whole list of questions. What what is actually a home? And its home is in a neighborhood. Now, I'm trying to visualize that in my community of O'Leary Inverness. You know, I live in a house in the Murray Road, and I have a you know, uh, the neighborhood of Lot 11, and it's within a riding of O'Leary Inverness, and it's within Prince County, and it's within. <laughs> you know, uh, within the province of PEI. Uh, how is that different from my health center in O'Leary and the Pine Valley Health Center that goes to the Prince County Hospital for a level of services, or it might go to uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital for uh, uh, certain services, ophthalmology and things of that nature, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the question then becomes, <laughs> how are these homes going to help health care? Because in the end of the day, you still only have so many doctors around here, and we seem to have done a pretty poor job of trying to uh, recruit more uh, uh, into the system, Mr. Speaker. So, so then I'm trying to get a sense on these homes. As they, are these new buildings? Well, I see an RFP out for a new one in Alberton, a new building. And it's, you know, it, it, if you read the RFP, it doesn't give you a whole lot of detail. It's, a, I think, the potential delivery of service, like 2025. It's quite a ways away. And, uh, you know, it, it just, we, we just don't get a real sense of that. So how does that fit in with the other four that are supposed to be? Or is this the, the home, or is this just a replacement of the doctor's medical center in Alberton? Don't know that answer. Can't seem to find that answer out. Uh, you know, the other part would be, where are they located? Now, you know, that might be one. Well, OK, then what impact does that have on the O'Leary Health Center? Or what, hap what does it have in Surrey? What, ha what impact does it have in the Crapo clinics? Uh, what, ha what impact does that have in Pine Valley? Are we taking somebody from one service to, and shifting them to another location? Are these physicians that, uh, that are delivering services out of those locations, uh, you know, how, how does it impact on them? Uh, yet, uh, we still have not been able to get the details uh, of what this is all about. Uh, I've tried to find out, uh, I remember asking the Premier about what services will be provided there. Well, all the services will be provided there. Of course. Yeah, all of them. Well, what, what's all mean? You've got to define that a little bit more. So, uh, you know, uh, is it a case where, uh, you know, if I've if I got to go get a uh, uh, medical record for, uh, to renew my truck driving license? That was the last time I've been to see a physician. Uh, for whatever reasons, I've been kind of silly enough to sort of keep my truck driving license as a politician. But this is a pretty precarious position, <laughs> and sometimes you never know how long it's going to last. So, so uh, if I still have to go out and, and uh, drive a truck uh, to uh, make a living, I'm, I'm at least able to do that. But actually, the real reason I tend to do it, Mr. Speaker, is that it kind of gives me a reason to go get a physical and to try to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm getting through this world and I'm in good physical shape to uh, identify if there's any challenges uh, that I might be upcoming. So uh, from a health care perspective, Mr. Speaker, so I'm happy to pay the, the, the fee and get my truck driving license renewed and I'll keep, I'll keep doing that, Mr. Speaker, uh, at least for a little while anyway. Uh, but, but, you know, so that is, is that going to be, and, and from my perspective, my understanding is it can't be. It can't be the janitor that signs off on that for the Department of Transportation. It can't. It, it can't be a nurse. It can't be the receptionist. It has to be the doctor that signs off on that. So it seems like, with, you know, is that something that a service that you'd get there? You know, I, I think of the situation. Uh, you know, somebody are you, like as an example, we talked one time here about having oncology services. Uh, I think that was in a previous throne speech that the government was going to come out and deliver. Oncology services in uh, rural hospitals, I believe, was the, the term. I kind of advocated a little bit about O'Leary. I thought it would be a great spot to have it. We have an ambulatory care nurse. And IV therapies are provided there. That would make perfect sense. Yeah. Yet, not a thing. Nope, don't, don't hear a thing about where that service went. But gone. Poof, vanished in thin air. 
so, but is that going to be housed in this home? Instead of the health center, it's going to be in the home. So then if you're going to provide some of those services, do you, do you have the, you know, the, the supports and backups for that? And if you already have that, if in a place like O'Leary, why, why do you need a, a home up the road a few miles? It doesn't seem to make much sense to me, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so it's very critical that we get clarity on the types of services that will be, hand, uh, be at that location and how our physicians and those patients that are unaffiliated with the family doctor are going to access those services. You know, we, we always sort of say that we always have access. All islanders have all 150, 60,000 of us have access to a doctor. It's just that it, you may have to go to an emergency room. To Really, we have our two main emergency rooms, Prince County Hospital and QEH, and we have two sort of support emergency rooms at, uh, at Mont Kings County in Montague and in Alberton. And, uh, so, you know, is that, is that the type of access we're requiring? Well, that's not the access. If I'm wanting to go get my medical to get my truck driving license, then I can go to an emergency room and get that. Can't be done. And let's say, who signs off on this? That's the other part of it. Let's say, at the end of the day, now maybe, maybe the Minister of Transportation is going to say, you don't need that anymore. A nurse can sign off on that. And that, and that may be fine. But the, how does that apply then if that trucker is going off island? And, he's, and the driver's off island and, and something happens from a healthcare perspective and heaven forbid an accident occurs, things of that nature. And then all of a sudden, I can guarantee you what's going to happen. You're going to have lawsuits. You're going to have insurance companies fighting back and forth. And they find out in PEI, in PEI, oh, uh, the janitor can sign off on a medical. You know, or, or an RCW. This must be realistic. <laughs> well, but you know, I'm just saying, th these are the facts that, uh, that are out there, Mr. Speaker, that there's liability issues. When I was a Minister of Health, liability was a daily com comment on any of the services that we wanted to change or, or deliver in Prince of Rhymes. You know, and we had, and we had to uh, make sure that liability, and, and, and there would be hardly a day goes by, as, as the previous minister would know and the current minister would know, that there isn't some challenge with liability within the healthcare system, Mr. Speaker. And that's just a fundamental reality of today's society. The other part of it, like I mentioned earlier before, in these changes for healthcare homes and things of that nature, will it comply with accreditation services? I mean, it might. I'm not saying it won't. But on the other side of it, I can't get that answer. I asked the Premier that question. Does this comply with accreditation standards? It's, if it's different than other places, and it's new, innovative, and it's a bold way of delivering health care, you have to answer that question. Does, you know, when, when we do get an accreditation, will this be something that the accreditors, who are usually health professionals from all over Canada, they come and they come, they send them to our particular province, and they evaluate our entire health care services. It's quite a process. I've been through it. I'm not sure if the current ministers went through it or not, or the past minister was through it, but it, it's a, quite a process. And uh, if you want to see stress on boards, if you want to see stress on the staff uh, going, and all across the, the island, all our health care deliverers of services, uh, of which we have about 5,500 people, they are going to, uh, they're, they're going to be under a lot of stress and they know they're going to be evaluated and they want to pass. <laughs> they want to do their level best to pass. And we see when you do pass, we'll get, there's banners in our facilities that, you know, we're accredited for uh, uh, health care services in the, in the country. So, you know, when we're developing a concept around health care homes, how does that fit into the accreditation? How does it fit into the liability? You know, the Premier has been very resistant to the term doctor for every islander. However, this is what many islanders expect from their, from their government because they, they want access to these types of services. And they need clarity if you're changing those services. If I don't need my uh, truck driving license signed by a physician, it would be nice to know who is going to be signing that, you know. Uh, if, I'm not, if, I, if I just have a sore throat, uh, can I go to the pharmacist and, and they can prescribe me? I, I'd certainly see that our pharmacies are out there that I think they are uh, a uh, service that accesses many islanders. I think there's 40 or 50 of them across the island. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly commend the minister for uh, the uh, services that they just added to the system uh, that pharmacists can prescribe for. I think that's a great move. And I think there's potential to do more of that in, in, the, in some services, Mr. Speaker. But if it's a case where 
you know, strep throats might be a bit more complicated. Uh, what if it's a child? Uh, can they take that person to a pharmacist and get a prescription? Is that a, a safe and effective way of dealing with a potential a medical issue? You know, the way we have it now, if you can go to see your family doctor within a few days, you have that ability to do that, and you know that it's going to be a, a healthcare professional that is trained at that level of family medicine, and they can uh, make those decisions. So I think that's, that's where we need that sense of, uh, of clarity and why it concerns me so much and why we've decided to come forward with this particular motion is that uh, when you have you know, over 16,000 Islanders that don't have access to a family doctor, they need to know that, those questions. Can they access that stuff? And, and what are the implications? And you know, if I don't have a family doctor, and who can prescribe me something should I require? And is it the right prescription? And is it to deal with the efficacy of whatever my particular illness is, Mr. Speaker? So you know, when we see numbers like the first part of this motion, it talks a little bit about Whereas now more than 16,000, when somebody said today it's 16,500 and some islanders in the patient registry waiting for access to a family doctor. And I know, I keep saying them, and they threw it back on me that you didn't put all your, uh, your patients on either. But we know there's at least 3,000 patients that aren't on that registry from Dr. Crothers. So we know that number is closer probably to 20,000. And I understand why you don't put those on immediately, because usually the rule of thumb is in health, uh, with health care is you try to hold together that panel size for a new physician that might come in and, and take over that position. So now that's a large uh, panel size, 3,000 patients plus. I mean, I think in general terms, you see doctors would have between 1,500 and 2,000. But, but the reason you hold them together is because that if a new physician does come in, they can take over the, all, that, all the files, all the, the, the paperwork, and they're ready to deal with them. They're up to speed. And they might even have, uh, Dr. Crothers might have had some staff that uh, would be familiar with these patients, and that doctor fills right in in that position and moves forward. The other issue is, is that you can hold that panel together for about six months, and that allows uh, that the files don't get too overly outdated, that, uh, they, that those patients can go see maybe a nurse practitioner or other services that they can provide for that. So that makes some sense in doing that. But we know 3,000 patients is a high number. That's a fact. And we know you can't fill, <laughs> you got 16,000 without. So let's be honest, that that's close to 20,000 people without a family doctor. So that, you know, that's, that's about seven positions that you've got to fill just to kind of start to break even. And uh, you know the other the other part of this, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, like I said before, I I knew it's it, it's a tough battle to try to get all islanders to have a family doctor. I'm not disputing that for a moment. I had it. I guess it was around 8,000 when I was minister. We've seen it over double since my time, and that's not all that long ago. That's three years ago. And uh, you know the the government says, well, we inherited. But it's the mess we inherited. Well, I can tell you what we inherited back when the Bins government went out. Oh, what was that? Same thing. Look, there's numbers that were, they were abysmal at that time too. Now, you know, I'll talk a little bit later on as I keep going on here about uh, what, what we did achieve for the numbers that we had when I was minister, Mr. Yes. Speaker. And we did. We were down, we were down around 8,000 uh, people uh, on the patient registry. Not great numbers. Not numbers I'm proud of, Mr. Speaker. I tried my best to try to get it as, as good as we can. And, and I do know that, uh, you know, Larry, uh, my riding, Mr. Speaker, we had two doctors. Now we have four. And they're pretty stable doctors. And West Prince got, got very stable in its health care system. Now, Dr. Fox was there when I was there. Now they've got uh, Dr. Entwistle. But, you know, so they recruited one. But, but I'm, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that we did have a fairly good complement of family doctors during my time in West Prince. Now, East Prince, there was some challenges, Mr. Speaker. I, I readily admit that. And, and like I say, we worked our very best to try to put the processes in place uh, to recruit physicians, and we did have some successes in that. But now we're seeing up to six, over 16 to 20,000 patients. That's a high number. Now, that, now you're starting to get a little bit behind the eight ball here. And I can tell you that when you're trying to recruit physicians, you're trying to find, there, the, uh, what's a question that a physician's going to ask? Well, how many vacancies do you got down there? When I was Minister of Health, we had the best per capita ratio of people with a family doctor in Canada, Mr. Speaker. Not only that, 
but we were certainly doing well in uh, the Atlantic provinces, Mr. Speaker. Now we went from first in the Atlantic provinces to worst. The worst. I can't believe it. Now that's, now that's just in, in, in two short years, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, it's great. It's great to, uh, to blame, uh, you know, COVID was the reason or, or the, the previous minister's failed pub crawl to Ireland. Didn't go so good, you know. But, but you know, that's, that's what happens sometimes, Mr. Speaker. You know, when you're trying to drive the snakes out of Ireland, it sometimes takes a while to do that. But, uh, but, but, that, but the, he must have got a lot of blarney when he was over there, that's for sure. But, uh, but anyway, but I, but I commend the minister for trying. He tried to recruit doctors. I suggested many times here that we, places we should be looking at was out, out west, Mr. Speaker. I think we had some possibilities there. Uh, to uh, probably recruit some physicians. Uh, but we haven't seen much success on that side of it either, Mr. Speaker. Uh, all I can see that we've done so far is we've hired one doctor to try to find another doctor, to which we've taken a doctor out of the system to go find others. It's like the blind leading the blind sometimes, Mr. Speaker. We, gotta, we have to uh, put the, get our professional recruiters in place. We have to get them going and spend the money to go get the people out there and try to find, find these physicians. They're not easy to find. There's not an unemployment line of a whole lot of physicians out there. My time as minister, Mr. Speaker, you'd have, you'd have a lot of uh, doctors that were trained in other countries, and they would come forward. Uh, and I'd hear people say, there's a doctor in South Africa. They're interested in coming. We'd go check them out. And, you know, sometimes their educations weren't up to the Canadian standard. Any physician we recruit outside of Canada, they have to pass the medical exams for Canada because Canadians require a certain standard of uh, professionalism in their delivery of services, Mr. Speaker, that they have confidence that these people are trained. Then they have to get their license approved by the College of Physicians. And uh, sometimes there are language barriers that are, are impacted on that regard, Mr. Speaker. And that has, a, has once again, a bearing on, uh, once again, that Islanders have confidence in, in the people that are delivering these services. Do they all work out? I've seen, I've seen situations during my time as minister uh, where physicians were, got through the process, passed the test, got their, their uh, license approved, and started practicing, and it didn't work out real good. And, uh, and what tends to happen is you get, uh, you get uh, complaints. Complaints then are forwarded to the College of Physicians, and all of a sudden, a license gets pulled. Now the minister's left with a scenario that they've got somebody that they're going through a review, they're trying to get the, figure out whether they're competent and capable in the, in the proficiencies of delivering health care on the island, and all of a sudden, after a lengthy process and appeals and the list goes on, they're gone. And then, then you get another vacancy. So it, it's, it's, it's quite concerning, Mr. Speaker, when, uh, when we see us go in Prince Edward Island in two short years from first to worst. And uh, we have to do better. We have to uh, do a better job of recruiting. And we have to make sure that we're putting in a system that eliminates the impediments to uh, professionals from working here, but yet provides a good standard of service that Islanders can expect. And uh, my time, you know, we really focused on trying to create collaborative models of health care. And that's where, once again, we always had the doctor in the, as the peak of the pyramid. We added nurse practitioners. I forget, I think I signed off and maybe having about maybe 20-some extra nurse practitioners. Now, that was something we had to negotiate with the medical society. Uh, you can't just add nurse practitioners at will. You, that, you have to go through the, your collective agreement with your master agreement with your physicians. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that there's not... Uh, systems in place to renegotiate some things quickly if you want to add a few more nurse practitioners into the system. That can happen through the master agreement, Mr. Speaker. But, uh, but you know, just in, in those years that I've been a Minister of Health, you know, we've seen, like I say, we went from first to worst, seen the patient registry double close to triple. Uh, you know, I keep saying, I've said it here before, that, you know, your, your patient numbers are rising faster than your debt ticker clock, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Just zoom, up they go. Uh, it is clear that the problems are quickly, quickly worsening in island health care, Mr. Speaker. And instead of recommitting to a goal of seeking a doctor for every islander, the Premier decided we're not even going to try anymore. We're going to come up with a new system. We're going to roll the dice. We're going to see what these homes are going to do. But yet, you know, as a, as a, once again, as a, as a critic looking over, 
I heard shovels in the ground for the uh, Hillsborough Hospital the day after we're elected. That's fast. No shovels much yet, you know. I mean, they're talking, maybe they got some sidewalks they're working on there now, but we're not seeing yes. any of the real services that are, being, that are needed for Islanders that they can deliver, Mr. Speaker. So that's where I, you know, I started to feel that, uh, you know, we need to, to make sure that we're going with the, the lofty goal of trying to find a doctor for every Islander and understand that there'll be challenges. But if you, you still only have the same amount of doctors, I've said this, this before, you know, you have, I don't know, we, we have a, there's probably about 100 uh, family doctor positions uh, out there, and I think, I think you might have, what, about 80 now, something 80-some. So you have to do a little bit of math here. So let's, let's assume you've got 80 doctors, you've got 150,000 people, there'd be some that would be infants and things of that nature. Uh, that means you've got a panel size of 1,875 people that are looking for, that are, would be with these family doctors. So if you if you're turn around and you're going to say that you're going to uh, take the amount of doctors you are, you're going to reassign them, well now all of a sudden you're going to take the, make the service worse for the, for the other 80 some percent of the people that do have a family doctor, that do have access to their doctor, to get their truck driving licenses and medicals uh, done up, Mr. Speaker. So those are the types of things that you have to think about. I want to know what this service is going to look like and how it's going to impact everybody. Because in the end of the day, you only have up that pool. You have a pool of that many doctors. So if you can recruit that many and divide your numbers, you can get back to 1,500, then people say, well, I, I can accept that level of service. But if the rest of it, if I get to share my doctor, that he's going to be dealing on the heart, way bigger panel size, then I don't have access to that doctor as much as I might like or my family might like. And then that impacts the backlogs and the, and the problems that may exist on that, Mr. Speaker. It's the same with our emergency rooms. If you're, if you're getting rid of the PUCS systems, you're going to put more people in the emergency room, so there's more people going to be there to, to get a service. The wait times get longer, people get more frustrated. And, uh, and I'm hearing these stories from constituents, Mr. Speaker. I had a constituent that called me the other day, and I was going to add it to my question list there. Four hours of prep for surgery. <coughs> for, for uh, surgery, uh, cancer treatment surgery, had her IV in her arm, got into the waiting room, or in, uh, into the emergency, or not the emergency room, the surgical room, can't, can't continue on. Yeah, we're going to have to go back home, come back in a couple of weeks' time. Now, just so you know, I heard she got the surgery today, and I think it went pretty well, so I appreciate that. But you imagine the, the stress and anxiety that that puts on a, on a constituent of mine that, uh, that uh, is, was a healthcare professional, I might add. And, uh, you know, she's prepped, IV in the arm, and told her can't do the surgery. Why? Well, I guess it's some anesthesiology problems, <laughs> issues. Now, I get, I think everybody would understand if, a, you know, there was a tragedy or a car, big car accident, and, you know, sometimes that can happen. I get that. But not because of healthcare professionals not able to do their duties or their shifts are too long, Mr. Speaker, and they can't do it safely. That's, that's, not, that's not acceptable level of customer service that we need to be providing for our Islanders, Mr. Speaker. I, I've mentioned a question here to the minister the other day about a coloscopy, coloscopy services, uh, you know, where a general internist <coughs> needs to be provide a particular level of service. The family doctor is, is working with the patient. They're trying to find them in the level of service and vacancies again. Now, the minister did make an announcement. I think there was somebody starting the next day. Well, that's one, but you got a couple others that are still vacant, Mr. Speaker. So it, it waters down the level of service. And then we get into the issue about where you get that service. So if that service is, uh, you have to get it off island, that comes at a cost. I was looking at our, our out of province medical costs, about $50 million, Mr. Speaker, we're putting into off island medical services. And if we're not, you know, the cheapest and best way to provide that is here. And I'm even told it's hard to get those services off on because those provinces are dealing with their own uh, uh, residents, Mr. Speaker. So these are the types of challenges when it comes to recruiting doctors that need to be done. Uh, we need to get these people. Uh, you know, we've watched this, uh, this government uh, continue to let the services deteriorate. And we've repeatedly asked the Premier, the Minister of Health, the past and present, how many people will come off the registry in 2021 as a result of these new homes. So far, no idea. Uh, it, it sounds like they're just going to morph everybody, all islanders, into these homes. And once again, is, is that going to be a level of service that's any better? 
and uh, you know we have uh, issues around our master agreement that we have to fulfill in this and you know is the is the medical society in support of this uh, I don't know those answers at the moment mr. speaker but uh, I think those are questions that we need to find more of so certainly as a, as a minister of health I can completely appreciate exploring new and innovative solutions to long-standing <laughs> problems however at the same time we still have to deal with the problems today so we'll assume these homes, that's maybe, but it may be 2025 before you get these up and operational. So we have to uh, say, what are you doing in 2021, 2022? What do you, do you just wait? You know, we, we, need, we need to do better. So we need to look at, uh, you know, innovative uh, solutions that we can deal with and deal with these today. You know, I, I know, uh, you know, we were, when I was in, we, you know, we had expanded uh, our health care uh, situations and needs, uh, you know, I remember adding more uh, dialysis uh, beds. We upgraded, I think, in your hospital, Mr. Speaker, in Surrey. We upgraded the dialysis system there. And I believe you and I went for a little tour of that facility at that time. And you were advocating for the need for that. And I remember uh, Cheryl Dorn uh, that uh, gave us a tour of that fabulous uh, dialysis system there. And uh, you had uh, patients that uh, needed that service, and we done that. I also recall adding a periodontal dialysis services where people could get some of those services in their own home, Mr. Speaker, and that was to take the pressure off our dialysis beds. At the time, when I was minister, I believe there was, a, I think there was about 95 islanders that were requiring dialysis services. Now, I'm not sure what they are today, but we really only had capacity for about 100 at that time. Now, I haven't heard anybody coming to me saying that they're not getting appropriate dialysis services, but I just, I just emphasize the importance of having health care delivery and having it in rural communities and hospitals like, like uh, uh, Surrey Hospital. And uh, I know the, the member from Montague Kilmuir said he wants dialysis in Montague, and I'll say I want them in, at Community Hospital in O'Leary. But that's where the decision comes, where ministers have to make tough decisions and making sure that we're providing them. But I do think it's important that we're always providing services in our rural communities because the rural islanders need that service, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, I can think of uh, during my time as minister, I was looking there, I, I added 290 drugs to the formula, Mr. Speaker. Now, I, I understand that that's always a, there's new drugs coming out every day. We've seen the process, what's unfolded with the vaccines for COVID. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it's, a, it's an interesting process, but I know as minister what you'd have is that there'd be always somebody contacting you that there's some new drug that is uh, important to the uh, cure or the treatment of a particular islander. And all the new drugs, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you they're expensive. I recall the day Solaris was a drug that at that time was the most expensive drug uh, in, uh, in Canada, maybe the world, I'm not totally certain, but I believe it was about $800,000 for Solaris for one year to treat somebody. That's a tough day for a Minister of Health when you've got a person and a family that uh, needs a particular drug and that's the type of cost that you have to deal with. And uh, it's never about the cost, I understand that. But as a minister, you've got to go uh, to uh, take the recommendations of the doctor who, the, you know, there's a process to, to get a drug on the formulary. The therapeutics uh, uh, committee, uh, pharmaceutical and therapeutics committee, sorry, uh, they uh, uh, take requests from family doctors to see if that drug could be added to the formulary to get that uh, service uh, provided. And uh, they look at the, all the, the efficacy and is that drug being approved by Health Canada and things of that nature. And sometimes they get turned down, sometimes they get approved. But when you get the word from the Pharmaceutical and Therapeutics Committee that, it's a, that they would like to recommend it, then the minister's got to go to the Minister of Finance. Because usually, I can almost guess uh, the, the Minister of Health doesn't have that new drug in the budget. <laughs> And then you've got to go through that process. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll say my time as government, I'm sure the current government will do what, it's can, what it can to make the right decisions when it comes to that. But, but that's, what, that's what you're kind of up against, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I can remember another big announcement that I made when I was Minister of Health was uh, we added uh, the PEI generic drug program. Oh, program. Over, yeah. 16,000 dollars taking uh, advantage of that uh, that particular program. I'm not sure what it's probably high, way higher than that now. But we didn't do nothing, and we didn't leave this uh, government with a barren cupboard here. There was lots of lots of things going on. We had lots of physicians. We had lots of people doing things. Never where I would have wanted, maybe, Mr. Speaker. 
But we didn't inherit a perfect uh, situation either when we took over government back in 2007. Another thing that I did to try to help Islanders, Mr. Speaker, you recall, I remember it was the, I think it was the member at the time from Charlottetown West Royalty, Bush Dunville, former member here, put a lot of emphasis on free parking at the QEH. You know, and uh, we uh, added that. that not, a, not a huge cost in the scheme of things, but uh, uh, that would be something that we've done. I can recall adding occupational therapy services, uh, uh, restorative care services is something we've added. We added in at the Prince Edward Home and at the, at the, at the commun community hospital in O'Leary. Wonderful services that kept people from accessing their doctors and trying to, to uh, alleviate the, the duties that all these doctors had to do to keep these services done. We do added new lab tech positions at QEH, remember? Because once again, testing was required, you know. Uh, and I, I, one that I recall that was uh, during my time was we had the new linear accelerator, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, at the Cancer Treatment Center. And we had to eat, not only in our case, it wasn't a matter of just adding it, we had to build the building around it because we only had one. So if you're, if you're or, uh, sorry, we had two, so if you're adding another one in, you couldn't take one down, so we had to add, try to have space for three and try to always keep two uh, services there, Mr. Speaker. So those, those were tough, those were tough, and those were big money items. So those machines are new, fairly new, you know, so, uh, but this isn't, you know, then we get into the whole issue about you deal with the, the Canada Health Act, Mr. Speaker, it's another big issue. You have to comply with the Canada Health Act. You can't privatize services. You have to be careful what you can privatize or not. And I'm not disputing for a moment that you can't privatize uh, the issue about the mobile rapid units uh, if it's very comparable to an ambulance. But, you know, at the end of the day, the, you know, we get this mixed communication that they're going to add this service uh, to, uh, to the system. It's going to be managed by Island EMS. And then we're told it's not managed by Island EMS. Then we said it was first it was going to be operated by Island EMS. Now it's not being operated by that. So then I'm saying, well, what's the point of Island EMS? What, where's Medivis' role in this? Well, they're just providing some rent, some space. You know, so these are the things that I've asked questions about. What, what's the get? go on this. It, like I say, I don't, I don't have a problem with the fact that uh, Island EMS is involved, but come, come clean with Islanders. Tell us what it is. Is it a privatized system or not? How's it work? How do you, how do you work with the Canada Health Act to see that uh, it's managed, if it's managed by a private entity, but it's uh, staffed by uh, the health PEI people, how does that work? Is that, is that a workable arrangement? Uh, what do the people think about it? It's almost like you know, our Jack and the Beanstalk Premier come up with, you know, here's an idea, I get some magic beans. Maybe I'll, I'll spread a few beans around, I'll get a, a big, uh, get to the, the city of gold somehow, Mr. Speaker, and solve this. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, these are tough decisions that you make in the, as a government. And, and, and I might emphasize, they are the government. Two years, oh, two years, we inherited a mess in two years. That's two years, you're halfway through your mandate. <laughs> Halfway through it. it that's, that excuse gets a little old. <laughs> it gets a little old. And, and, islanders, and islanders are starting to say, well, that's the, gee, the two years, that, that, they should be able to run something in two years' time. You, you know, so, you know. Let's go find out. Oh, no, I, and I, I, they're making some comments about how high they are in the polls. And they are, they're, they're riding high in the polls. But I always, my dad always said, the higher you go, the further you fall. So be careful of that. Been there, been there, done that. Yeah, somebody will cut that beanstalk down. Yeah. When, the, when the Jack of the Beanstalk Kramer uh, tells us, a story, you know, you, you have to get it right. And people get a little tired of the story. So I'm getting them, they're telling me. Tell them there's not, you know, is there ever any facts of these things? So, so we, got, we, got to, we got to get these. We, so it is important that the Premier and the Minister communicate the message right. Yeah, they got to, they got to communicate the message right. It's, it's, you know, is, is it Island EMS is running it or it's it not? I mean, like I said, it's, that was a simple one. You should have been able to figure that one out. What, you know, it must have had that thought out and planned. Four people were saying right. And, and, and we don't, and we, we're still kind of up in the air. I know I think the minister somewhat put it to rest that it's not uh, Island EMS. Uh, but, what, but then begs the question, why was there even a discussion or a contract? It's, it all seems, kind of, seems a little fishy to me that people are kind of... Uh, dealing with this and trying to see how, what kind of service they can provide? Or is it a case where you got somebody that just says, I'm looking for some money to provide a service? I've had Island EMS come to see me when I was minister, and they have all kinds of little services they'd like to add on. 
and they're and they're good. You know, they're, uh, it's a good professional organization. But the, oh yes, they did. <laughs> I, 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 I might I might add that uh, the palliative care was something I had to deal with. But yeah, the good shepherd probably would give me, had to give me the authority to deal with it. But still, <laughs> but still. Still, I was, I, was the, I was the minion that had to do the negotiate. That's the main thing, you know. So, uh, so anyway, so I certainly encourage the Premier to reconsider the message that he's sending to Islanders or his team is sending to Islanders. You know, when he's saying that, you know, a, a doctor is not obtainable uh, for every Islander. It's just not, not where it needs to be. Because I keep saying in, in the healthcare delivery, you're dealing with patient stays. I remember looking at 170,000 patient stays a year we, we deal with in health. It's a big system and it's a big setup. 95,000 people visit the ER. Is that going to be more? Because it all takes you 4 or 5% more people that are going to the ER than normal, and that clogs the ER. Then your wait times get impacted. And I do remember the Good Shepherd telling me, how are we going to deal, <laughs> deal with these wait time problems? <laughs> how are we going to get this down to a, a, you know, a more reasonable amount? And a tough job to try to explain that. Do you know what that costs, that Premier I said? <laughs> I can improve it by 10 minutes, but that's going to cost you a few million. <laughs> Poor Premier near took a stroke that day. <laughs> it was a tough day. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But that's what you're dealing with. And I remember my time as Minister of Health, the wait times, uh, and this, this is Kai High's numbers for PEI, four hours and 10 minutes of the Prince County Hospital was the average wait times. Not, not great numbers either, and, and like I say, we had to try to deal with that. Uh, another issue I remember, long-term uh, care. This is one of the comments I was making on the two years thing, long-term care. Uh, average stay of long-term care residents of PEI, we deal with 213,000 resident day stays wow. a year. The average length of stay is two years. Well, it's up to three now. It was two years in my time. Wow. So, so that's where, that's where, well, we did, I did add more beds on my dad. Oh, no. I, I do recall adding six more beds in Belfast. I think one more in Tyne Valley. So we did add more beds, and then there was 50 more, or, the, or 20, more were did up late new. We made those announcements, Mr. Speaker. They can't staff them. So, so you know, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that it's a tough. That those are tough days to try to make those decisions. But the fact is, two years is the average stay. You had two years. You had two years. You should, we should, that problem should be solved today. But no, not solved. You know. Uh, so these are the types of things about you know who did who inherited what. Nobody inherits a system, the healthcare system that's perfect. But I had it, at least, and the Premier said many times, you just held it together with Baylor twine and duct tape. Oh. I think Islanders would take today, Baylor twine and duct tape would go pretty darn good to try to get to this uh, mecca of uh, 2025 when these healthcare homes are going to yeah. be in place, yeah. Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, during my time, we increased uh, physicians. We went from 80 physicians, is what, what we inherited, to 93. Not 100, but you know, we're getting there. They haven't had it won. They just, they're just, you know, they're trying to replace a few, but they're going backwards. They get to say, we, in the end of the day, we got over probably about 20,000 people there with a patient registry. Uh, you know, uh, at my time, we were trying to recruit five family doctors and five specialists. I think they're at, looking for a lot more than that now. Uh, you know, we increased, I remember in my time in, uh, as minister, we increased the RN complement. 13% we increased the RN complement in this province. And when I was Minister of Health, Mr. Speaker, I was, I'd always look at this, we'd be looking at the advertisement. You, anybody can go on the, the government website, and I always would see about 2020, be 20 internal and 20 external vacancies in, in the nursing profession. Today, probably like 60, 60. So that's, a far, that's three times more than my time. So you know, if you're trying to compare what it's like, this is what happened in two years. Increase the uh, LPN complement by 17 percent, Mr. Speaker. You know, and these are, you know, these are some of the kai high that there's benchmarks out there on this, Mr. Speaker. So I think that's the, the type of thing that I would like to say that you know it's important that we, uh, you know, so if I'm at, in my case in our term as government, we added 145 more long-term care beds into the system over a period of time since 2007. I might add. I haven't seen any that the government operated. The minister said that we can't staff them anyway. So what's the point of adding more there? You know. So I think that's that's what I sort of see, Mr. Speaker. Is uh, we don't want to get into who inherited what. There is a government. There is an opposition. There's a third party. We're here. 
and uh, it's important that we identify some of the issues that are out there and, uh, and let's focus on trying to provide a level of service to government. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that's, that's really important, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think there's 150 to 160,000 Islanders that are counting on this government to provide them the opportunity to have a doctor for every Islander and a, a medical service that they can get the treatment they're required that meets liability challenges, it meets the standards of accreditation, and that it's uh, deliverable to Islanders uh, in a reasonable fashion, Mr. Speaker. So, so with that, I'll uh, conclude my remarks and uh, hand it over to uh, the seconder, Mr. Speaker. I think I gave him a lot of time. Yeah, Honourable <laughs> <laughs> member from Charlottetown, West Warwick. <clears throat> well, yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't think I'll need the podium. I think I can, I can handle it. And, this is, a, this is a very, very important issue, and I think my colleague outlined it very accurately, that it should always be our goal. It's a doctor for every islander should always be our goal. And I'm not sure when it changed. It seemed like when the speech from the throne just came out, it, it seemed like everything was a, it was a dead pivot. Okay, and, and a dead pivot in sporting world means that you just stop on a dime and you change direction, and that's never a good thing. Because when you do that, you lose control. And that's what I'm worried about. And looking at, looking at the, the, the system now and how we're talking to the people that we represent, um, they come to you, they don't say, oh, I want, I want to be part of a medical hub or a home. They say, I need a family doctor. Okay? And you know, some of the most important and some of the most trying situations are when somebody without a doctor is, is trying to get medical support and then you hear the words, you hear different things like th they could be at stage four cancer or they could be, they could be f facing something catastrophic. And these are the type of things with 16,000 people on the registry we lose control over. And we don't have a focus on the plan. And you look, you look at your plan and, and you look at the speech from the throne, and I talked about it extensively in here during my response to it. Okay. You had a line in there, it's the, the medical uh, hubs or home are not going to be revolutionary, it'll be evolutionary. Well, I don't see it. I don't see that. We need to stay focused on people that we represent. And they are, a lot of them are struggling. And, and people in my, okay, um, I might call for an adjournment. I'll, 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 I'll adjourn debate. Um, seconded by uh, the member from uh, Cornwall Meadowbank. Sure, Carey. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the first order of the day be now read. Sure, Carey. Carey. Order number one: Consideration of the estimates in committee. Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that this House do now resolve itself in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration grant of supply to Her Majesty. Cheryl Carey. Carey. Honourable Member from Tignesh Palmer Row, <coughs> Deputy Speaker to the Chair, Committee of the Whole House, please. <coughs>
Town Committee of the Whole House to consider the grant of supply to Her Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Uh, honourable members, we are beginning on page 34 of the Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, we'll read that section momentarily. I'm going to give way or the floor to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to uh, table some questions as asked uh, during budget estimates, and I'd like to present them now regarding the balance of the loan remaining, uh, information regarding the Muscle and Oyster Marketing Development Initiative, and also questions regarding to FACTAB and the rig system, and also uh, another question regarding municipalities, and also about the Department of Policy and Procedure. Shall carry? Carry. You have this one, too. Um, would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Uh, Shannon Burke, Director of Finance for Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you very much and okay. welcome. Um, again, Honourable Members, we are on page 34, the Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, the Minister, yes? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got correspondence from the questions that were asked yesterday that I didn't have answers to. So I've got a copy for uh, the official opposition as well as the third party. Awesome. Okay. And, um, Object. Okay, workforce <laughs> development, skills PEI, appropriations for, provided for the administration and delivery of programs targeted to improving the Prince Edward Island labour market. Administration, 594,800. Equipment, 16,000. Material supplies and services, 82,900. Professional services, 112,300. Salaries, 3,632,700. Mm. Travel and training, 55,000. Grants. Workforce Development Agreement, 2,151,100. Labour Market Development Agreement, 20,835,100. Provincial Programs, 4,666,000. Total Skills PEI, 32,145,000. 900. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, note that the, um, there's been some reallocation of funds, so I can see that there, there's obviously a, um, a significant um, increase in some areas, and, and, and I'm just looking to see, so has there been a major reorganization, particularly around work experience PEI? It seems that maybe that program's been closed down and it's been moved into other programs. Could you perhaps give some outline and what may have happened there. Where do you see the reallocation? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at, I'm just making sure, actually, I'm just making sure I'm looking at the right section. Bear with me one moment there. Okay. Too many pieces of paper on the go here. Um, so, um, you have a training PEI as the, you've got an increase of three or oh, two point five million dollars. Employment assistance program is going up one point two million. Employee is going up two million. Um, this is in forecast to budget. The self-employed program is six hundred thousand. Labor market partnerships is six hundred thousand, and work experience PEI is going up. So there's there's a major, there's a that variance. The work experience one, sorry, shows a 6.46 million, and then there's zero in the budget line, and it's equivalent. But your your overall budget amounts are the same yep. for the LMDA. So the LMDA overall hasn't increased, but there's been a really significant reallocation of funds, and what it looks like is that the work experience program has been wrapped up. Yeah. So that under under the forecast column, that's actually what we had spent. It, yep. It's actuals up to the end of January, which was when we were doing the forecasting process. So you'll actually see the variance to forecast the 6.4 million that wasn't spent at that time. Um, so it would filter through a lot of those other programs. So if you look at budget to budget, the, right. the amounts are probably the same. Charlotte Belvedere. Thank you. I can make sense of my own notes and now I know what I was uh, trying to get. So, okay, so in that case then it's about the variance and you just said that the variance the, the labor LMDAs remain the same, but the variance then was was alloc reallocated into different areas. The the variance would be what was left to spend to year end from January thirty first to the end of March. So we when we prepared the handouts, we prepared them based on what the actual expenditure was to the end of January. So we still had a couple of months left to spend that. So it it would have been paid out through most of those programs. Charles on Belvedere. 
So then in that case, there, there doesn't seem, there hasn't been a significant change in, in how the funds are allocated in the LMDA in this new fiscal year? Or how no, are you expecting not, them to be allocated? Not so much the funds, but some of the program uh, criteria is changing a bit to simplify it once again because uh, we've run into that problem as well, uh, which I know yourself, Honourable Member, you had a, a couple of constituents that run into to problems. So uh, we've uh, reevaluated how we operate those programs and administer them. Uh, so there's changes there uh, as well. The federal government has been great. Um, they've been sending a lot of a lot of funds our way to uh, to help train and, and get people back in the workforce. So uh, uh, they've been great to work with and get, have gave us a little leeway with some of our programming as well. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. And we know that um, under the LMDA that there's been a very direct connection from that to EI eligibility, which is obviously looks very different now than it did previously. And that has often been a barrier to people being able to access. Um, how has that changed? Um, and will those changes be ongoing or, or temporary? I hope it's ongoing. Um, so obviously, um, COVID has helped us with that to get the federal government's ear on that, um, but there's still some work, work, to, work to be done on that. Um, we're still working with the federal government on the EI because it is a barrier for people trying to uh, get a different skill set and so forth, and they shouldn't be penalized with their EI by doing so. So um, I haven't had an update of, of where we're at with the federal government on that, but I know there's been ongoing conversations with my department and the feds on some different program ideas around that. Charlton Belvedere. Thank you. I know that the LMDA, the primary uh, goal is to get people back into the workforce, and, it, and it's rather than having to remain on EI. Um, are they still considered to be on the EI role while they're, if they are on a training program or other support program under an LMDA? Say that you mean. Are they still considered to be on the EI roles? Like, as an e, are they still counted as being on EI if they are in a program under an LMDA funded program? That's a good question. I don't know how they would count that. Yeah, they're certainly provided with the the dollars as if they right. were but yeah yeah i don't know if we would count it as ei though they would be provided with the dollars but let me see what i can find out and i'll bring that back sure i'll be over there thank you um a couple of, of, of it's a really specific question but i'm gonna ask it anyway um when, it, when we have had in the past um stories of challenges for people where um especially when they're doing the part of the programming under self-employed so starting a business mm -hmm. with the is that they get the, the funds are available, but the business support aspect, not so much. And, and we know that you have expertise in your department for that, but there's a, there is quite a, a, a separation, or there has been a separation between skills PEI and the activities for labor management, the labor market development agreement and innovation PEI. Has that been on your radar to, to continue to address, so that to break down some of those silos? Yeah, certainly so. This is, um approximately three, maybe four months, three months ago now, uh, we put the position in of the business navigator, uh, which has made life a lot easier for the business community. And I, I had a conversation with one young fellow the other day uh, who couldn't navigate the system, knew nothing about the supports, both provincial, federally, and the business navigator was able to access that. So uh, it's, it's been a huge success to, to date, and uh, the more people that are aware of it, the better. Charlottetown sure, Belvedere. Thank you. Um, could you just uh, explain the difference between the labour market development agreement pot and the workforce development agreement? Like they're, they're, they're obviously very distinct funds. What's the difference between those? Uh, the, I think the big thing and I, I, is, is that the, we're under the workforce development agreement, um, they don't necessarily have to have an EI um, <coughs> claim or one that was outstanding within the last however many months. So it's a smaller pot of funds, but um, it's a little bit more flexible. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. It, it's still a very significant amount of money. It's four and a half, you know, uh, whatever the, yeah, the total is four and a half million. Um, is this one, is this a fund that's available, this is a fund, sorry, try it again. This is a fund that is available to employers for their, to also to provide upskill 
That's training right. and so on, ra as, rather than it being for individuals who are outside the workforce? Is that part of it? That's part of it, yep. Charles yeah. Charles here. Thank you. Um, something else that I'd asked, asked previously, and I will ask again this year, is, is if we can actually get any idea of the, um, the number of the, the uptake, like what is the number of people that are going through the programs, and what kind of follow-up is done with them. So I know that a few years ago there was some real challenges around the self-employed program and mm -hmm. that it was had a lower success rate than if people had no program at all, which is really worrying. I know, I've heard anecdotally that's really improved, but generally when we're making this kind of investment, even though there's a federal dollar, it's a taxpayer dollar, so True. if we're making that kind of investment, um, you know, what's the experience of the people going through these programs and are they actually adding that value? It'd be really, It would be really helpful to, to understand when we're talking about this, this level of, of expenditure. Yeah, definitely. So that's one thing the department is working on uh, this year um, is to see how we allocate the funds, where the funds are going, uh, what the success is, and we're really holding uh, all the organizations to account because uh, if we're going to uh, provide funding, we want to see results out of it, uh, which I get an update usually every 30 days uh, as the funds close to, to uh, how it works and, and how many have gone back into the workforce. And it's worked out real well because we can adjust our programming because of it, but also it's pretty rewarding when you have a group like the Adventure Group that sends a message and say, you know, we've got 10 people graduating today, uh, here's an update, uh, such and such has gone to work at uh, this building supply store it's nice to see because you get to meet some of these people uh, so it's nice to see where their their progress along the way so I think it's going to work out uh, work out well and uh, I haven't seen any challenges with it yet and uh, we're going to focus on that this year Cheryl Tom Belvedere thank you and that that uh, chair that really leads me to a follow-up question which is you know I know that um, the labor market partnerships program is one that works with community partners to deliver sort of so career bridges example or East Prince or adventure groups some of those, those various sort of groups across the community um, cast people with disabilities do um, what with the employment assistance services um, is that also does that also reflect expenditures that are that kind of go through other community partners is, is there more than one space where we kind of have that money flowing through into to get to different groups i don't have the answer to that that's one that i'll have to ask the department on that one Cheryl mm -hmm. Tom Belvedere. thank you um speaking um with uh career bridges in particular I'll, I'll advocate specifically for that program which i am you know a huge fan of uh it's they they do absolutely a remarkable um, work to because it's way more than talking about helping people find jobs it's a, it's absolutely about sort of building people's life skills and personal skills and, and confidence which is usually the larger part of the story mm -hmm. in finding employment um, but I also know that they are really desperately struggling from a funding perspective um, they, they are continually turning people away they don't have enough capacity um, and so you know, put the flag in the ground, Minister, that, that, that community partners, as you mentioned the adventure group, and we, you know, we, we, hear, we hear a lot about how much does those community partners do to deliver. Um, when you've got this kind of a budget, it's not, it doesn't take a lot of extra to shift a couple of things around and sort of can we just, if, if, they, if they are clear that that's what they need. Yeah. Um, no, I, uh, I'll be honest, I haven't heard from Career Bridges. Um, but I will reach out to my department to see and find out what some of the struggles are because um, we have been able to work through most of them. Um, I'll be honest, Adventure Group, Reach Foundation, yeah. uh, East Prince Youth have all uh, come to us with some different programming, some funding. Uh, we've been able to support them. So I haven't heard personally from Career Bridges, but I'll certainly go back to the department and if there's any issues there, I commit to uh, checking in on them. Ms. Charlton Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. And sometimes it's, it's for historical reasons it could be even in a completely different department i don't know but right. it, it logically it would fit here but that doesn't this logic is not our friend most of the time so it may not be in your department yeah not certain um but in the context of of what we're trying to achieve with these funds that would it would make sense Good. can i also ask chair um uh regarding the digital skills for youth internship program is that program Understanding that earlier you talked about sort of variants yet to be booked, is that program yet to complete or did it not happen? Which programs are? Digital Skills for Youth Internship program. Three it's showing us italic. Sure. I'm not really clear what the expenditure is. So. 
I had some notes. So that's a federally funded program. And I think the internships were to end on March 31st. So are you asking if they're continuing or? Well, it's showing as a forecasted amount. There's mm -hmm. no estimate and there's no um, estimate. Yeah. There's no estimate for the current year either. So is it that yeah. the program didn't happen because of COVID or do we just? I, I think what happened last year was that the program was extended. Um, so it, it didn't actually make it into budget and we did get federal dollars to extend it a year so that's why you'll see it in the forecast but it's not in the previous year's budget but as far as i know it hasn't been extended to 21 22. charlotte town belvedere okay um i recognize that this is challenging you know where we're doing the budget where there's still expenditures this is the end of March madness so wait, i know <laughs> i reckon that the numbers are probably still coming in today right yeah um can you just explain, is, is the $200,000 experiential learning fund covered in this section? Yes, it is. Okay, so what, what kind of opportunities does that look like for this year? Are, is there kind of a, a goal of what we might help to achieve with that fund? Yeah, we uh, we had a, I forget how many positions, is, is it in there, Shannon, how many uh, positions? There's, uh, I don't have the numbers now, but there's 200000 in provincial funds for right. that for this. Okay. So there was a gap, obviously, um, which we had seen through the student union. Um, they had concerns, and the federal government wouldn't uh, allow us to uh, do anything on that end. So we had to, to, to go this route with the two hundred thousand. I think it's another twenty. Tw I better not say until I get the exact amount, <laughs> but it's twenty or twenty-five positions that will be available with that two hundred thousand. Hey, I'm sure. I'm but do you have many questions left on this section? I just I have others on the list, and I could Absolutely. come back if you don't mind. That'd be fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cornwall Meadowbank. She pretty much asked all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. That's fine. We're we're saving time. But uh, just on the salaries, I'm not sure if she asked that. I might have stepped out for that, but. Uh, there's another 200,000, and this was the question I was going to ask. I got jumped ahead the other day, and I was just wondering what position that was, or what position. So we have a cost of living increase tied to the collective agreement mm -hmm. of 69,200, and then we've increased, we, so most of the money that's spent in, in this division is federal dollars, and it's increased <coughs> over the years, and therefore our reporting requirements have increased in the administrative work has increased um, so we've also added two positions there to assist with some of the reporting that we have to bring back cornwall meadowbank does the labor market development agreement carry over if we don't spend the money you mean yeah um 20 percent and this year the feds have given us tremendous leeway because the amount of money that has been been sent uh where most provinces were struggling to to get rid of it we've done a relatively good job um, but yeah 20 percent of it would, would carry over Cornwall Meadowbank so have they provided any flexibility in that LMDA spend as I, far as trying to restart the economy and you know that kind of stuff yes this year they have they were great to deal with Cornwall Meadowbank on the digital skills for youth and I'm, I have no idea about this but is that was that not used at one time for coding in high schools that I don't know not to my knowledge, but yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'll check into that. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Cornwall Thanks, Chair. Oh, good. Hey, Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, we, we talked a little bit today about the uh, the micro loans and micro grants that we're kind of talking about. It would it be would it be under skills? Like I have trouble looking at through your department or In innovation. <laughs> oh, it's going to be yeah, through it's innovation. Through the so, innovation budget. Okay. Um, does um, does does the department track uh, uptake by groups uh, for skills in such fields as uh, uh, BIPOC, LGBTQ, uh, women women and people with disabilities? Yeah. So on the labor market data? Yeah. Y yeah. Um, is it great data? I would probably say no, uh, which is one thing we're focusing on this year is to get better data as a province. There's data as a country in each individual province, but we need to do a better job on our own uh, for the province of PEI for that, to track that. So that's a, an initiative we're doing this year as well. Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, 
would you? I, I know that economic growth, and I've, I've taken a lead because of the cultural piece. And I guess I have to ask some questions in here because I don't really see where that. And, and you've, you've supported those communities, um, and we've had discussions and conversations about um, that. Um, can you tell me what what's been happening over the last year and how? Your department has improved in the service delivery, the, the coordination with communities, and uh, what you're doing, what you've been doing as minister. Sure. So that all that would be through Innovation PEI, okay. but I can kind of give you a high level until until we get there. Sure. Um, so a lot's happened in the last year. Um, obviously, it's been a year of learning. Um, I know for me as minister, uh, trying to understand uh, and learn and and. and kind of work with the different organizations and group um, has been rewarding, I'll be honest. Um, we've had some good conversations um, with the BIPOC community. Uh, Tamara, i got to give Tamara credit. Every time I see her, she's got a smile that would just bright up a room, and uh, she's a tremendous person. So we've been able to work uh, with getting them some core funding. Um, we ended up getting some space in uh, the ATC, a uh, phenomenal space that was uh, was not being used, so we got creative and, and worked uh, with Tamara and her crew, as well um, as making some changes with our innovation programs um, to, to kind of look at it as a different lens, because there's been a lot of points that have come up over the, the past year um, to, to, to how we can improve and do better in that. Uh, so that's one thing we've been working towards. Um, one thing I want to make sure before we uh, put the final stamp on any of these programs is that all the organizations, everybody has input and feedback on it, that we just don't run out programs that aren't going to work. Um, so when the time comes, uh, which is going to be in the very near future, I want to make sure everybody's aboard before we, we hit go. Charles on West Royalty? And I'll wait to, to innovation to, to ask a few more of those uh, type questions. But um, uh, the, the PEI cult Cultural Human Resource Sector Council Incorporated 2021 forecast was 67.5. Could you tell me what that was? It's in the big book. Yeah. yeah. So you're looking at the handout 11? Uh, yes. Yeah. So that was actually related to curriculum development for digital skills for youth. Cheryl Town West Royalty. And um, was that, is there any data from that program or? You mean of how many people would went through it? So yeah. Yeah, there, there would be. We won't, don't have it here, but I can get it. Okay, yeah. Cheryl Town West Royalty. Okay, perfect. Uh, that's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of quick questions on the section, Minister. The employee PEI grant, is that is that the graduate mentorship program? I'm looking I don't at, believe yeah. so, but we'll check. I'm in the big book. Under grant recipients, I see employee PEI. I'm just yeah. wondering if that is, in fact, the graduate mentorship program. Mm, no, it's it's wage subsidies. Employee PEI is wage yeah. subsidies. Awesome. Can you Summer tell me where it? I would find the graduate mentorship program? Oh, actually, see down here. Yeah. Sorry, it is it is tied into graduate mentorship. So you'll see it in a couple of different areas. You'll see it in pro provincial programming, as well as the labor market development agreement. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. It, it appears to be up by forty-two thousand dollars, and I was just wondering if it's an actual increase in the budget, or if this program was underspent last year. So the fo the forecast line item. Um, is just what what we had spent up until March or sorry January 31st, so which was when we were preparing these handouts. Um, so the the actual expenditure up to March 31st, we we don't have that here yet. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Have you considered expanding this program any further? I know this was uh, one of the asks from UPEI. Yeah, we've talked about it. Um, the problem I find with that program, as good as it is, there's some faults to it as well. Uh, we see a lot of repeat um, businesses that are using that program. So it's designed to uh, take somebody um, that's graduated and put them into a full-time job, where I'm starting to see that program, uh, we've got certain people, employers, uh, rotating. 
which is not what the program's designed for. So uh, we're going to look at that and possibly make changes, but uh, we won't be adding to it. If anything, we'll be uh, maybe making it a little more tight. Summerside Rollmont. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your candid response on that. That makes a lot of sense to me. No further questions on this section. I do have one question on the handout you provided. I don't know if sure. yeah, that's fine. If that would be okay. It was particularly on the employment standards education and outreach and um, how is that communicated to people so they know about employment standards. And I note that one of the big chunks of how people are to access that information is through their employers. And it just strikes me that that might be a an obvious conflict, is that just my perspective on it? But if my employer is likely to not meet employer standards, they're likely also not going to notify me about it. So I just wonder if we could It's a very, at very good point. Uh, I'll be honest, that's something I never thought of before. Um, obviously, I just got that handout this morning as well. So uh, let me go back and, and do a little research through the department, see how long it's been like that and when it was changed and, and what can be done about that. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I, and they do have other th included as well. It's also job fairs and then high schools and universities, yep. but it just strikes me that there must be a better way where we can disseminate this information to workers. Valid point, for sure. Thank you. No further questions. Here, okay. Um, Mermaid Stratford. Great. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I'm mixing my words together. Um, it, Minister, I'm hoping that this is a section for the Ag Sector Council. Is that? Uh, so, yeah. Yes, I should be. Okay. And um, so is the funding, so there was increased funding last year, mm -hmm. right? Is that funding still in place for this year? Yes, I believe we've done three-year funding. Am I right in saying that? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure on the term, but and I know I there's actually been an increase in the sector council okay. funding. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. And is that project funding or is that core funding? I think it's both. But let me confirm that. Sure. I'm pretty confident it's both. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. One of the programs that they administer, and I and I think I asked the question, and like when we were in agriculture, but it came into this into this area, is around egg in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Is that and the provincial piece of funding for to be able to run egg in the classroom programming. So that's that would be there's a there's a grade three program, but there's also the high school program to, for students to do project work in order to encourage um, others to get into farming, right, or, or be aware of um, sec jobs in, within agriculture that people could look at when they are graduating. Is that something that the department, like all the other provinces do um, fund that from a provincial level. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that we don't actually fund that from a provincial level. Is that something that would be part of this um, area of the budget that we could look at in order to be able to encourage people to get into agriculture, given the labor shortages that we have there? Okay. I'm curious to why we don't. I, I'll have to go back to see why we wouldn't if other provinces are doing because I do know we do a lot of program funding for um, for uh, for them, so why we don't do that, I don't have the answer to, but I'll, uh, I'll see what I can find out and get back to you. Okay. Mermaid Stratford? And thank you, Chair, and that would be great. And I do have um, what other provinces are funding, and I'll for can I forward that to you, yep. and then we can kind of look at how can we encourage more people getting out of, universe, getting out of high school to Def go Def into agriculture. Yeah, no, one thing I found, and it's with a lot of the programs, is we haven't changed with the time, so maybe it's just something that hasn't been looked at. Um, I'm not sure if the request has come in and we denied it, but I'll, let me go back and, and check sure. in. Thank Mermaid you. Stratford. And just one other comment. I know that there is funding federally mm -hmm. that they've just received, but it would be great if we can, like other provinces, be able to offset that and mm -hmm. maybe expand what we're offering. Great. I'm great. Thanks, Chair. You're welcome. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And I just, oh, sorry, I just have a question on the handout, if yep. that's. Um, so just looking at the, the growth of the IT sector, I took part in a, a Zoom meeting put on by a group of women and extraordinary women in trades, and it was building bridges, it was called, and it was talking about um, growing the IT sector. Mm -hmm. And what a, what a kind of a perfect opportunity to engage women, because we have a lot of women in, in low paid work and we have a, a shortage of workers in IT. And so I, I notice here you're kind of looking at, at um, 
having a recruitment specialist role, talent recruitment specialist role to address labor gaps. And I'm wondering if that's a conversation that you've had or if that's something that, that you're hoping that this person will do or what? I haven't had that conversation, but um, that sounds like it would be a perfect opportunity for that workforce uh, integration fund, that $4 million pot, because uh, that's what it, it's designed for. Um, if there's any organizations out there that think they could roll out a program, um, I do think the federal government is given as leeway on, on some of them funds. It might be something we could look at to, uh, to speed that process up as well. Um, but I can go back and check with the department to see what work they have done, and, and I can let you know. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I'm good for now. Hey, um, Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, the provincial grants, uh, provincial projects line in under provincial programs. So you'd mentioned that this is, um, there was a couple of other items earlier that had been mentioned, but it's obviously it's a significant, if I'm reading this right, significant budget line. Could you just explain a bit more about what is encompassed under that line item? Yep. So in terms of the increase in the budget, um, the proposed workforce development agency is in there, um, which would be a new item. We have uh, our CW, LPN, and RN upskilling, the experiential learning fund, which we talked about. Um, there's additional funding going to Adventure Group and the REACH Foundation for um, attendees to, for the training to, to top up their training allowance so that it matches what they would receive um, on EI. Um, and then we have some sector council increases and then we've added some extra money if, if there was any sort of gap in terms of training because of um, things that didn't happen in the previous year or um, tra training that had to happen to improve people's skills related to changes um, as a result of COVID. So there's actually, we put an additional $2.5 million in there to cover those items in the new year. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Okay, it's really especially particularly good to hear the RCWLP and train upskilling piece. Um, the workforce development agency is actually coming in under a line separate from that. So you said that's $750,000. Um, what's the role of that agency different from the other, like you said, business navigator and all the other yeah. sort of? So what this is going to do is get us better data. Of, okay. uh, so we're getting data from all the provinces on our own under a federal lens, but we need better data here on, on the island that we can act quick, we can maneuver quick. Uh, so it's going to be real-time data that we can work with. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. And is that data just specifically about labor, labor market data, or is that a little bit more expensive, expansive? Um, I don't have all the details of what it looks like yet, but the majority from my understanding is, is the labor side of it. Because um, we find um, any time we're, we're looking for info, we're trying to pivot, we're going to uh, our national numbers. And so we're here it's going to be uh, close, immediate. We're going to know where we're at at all times. Because times are changing. You, you look, what, look what we went through with COVID, and we had to try and pivot through, uh, through it in a short period of time with really little knowledge of, of what the outcome was going to be. Um, so this is, this is going to be real-time data that's going to help us out. Charlton Belvedere. That, that's really that's really great to hear. I mean, I think you know my colleague just spoke um, prior from Shelltown, um, uh, Victoria Park about sort of the, you know, what do we do? Where's the gap? The gap there for women who want to enter into the IT field and how do you get in? You know, it's great if we've got somebody doing labour gaps from the employer's perspective, but what about people who mm -hmm. want to enter and and how do we understand? Is there opportunity there for them, and then what barriers are, are in the way? So um, I'm really hopeful that, that that data would help to inform those kind of decisions. Because yeah, when we've got again this amount of money, we want to be putting it in the right place, and we want to be getting ahead Definitely. of the gap, not having to kind of continually just react after the fact. Newfoundland uh, uses this model now. Obviously, they're uh, pretty significant what they do, but uh, yeah. it, it's something similar to what Newfoundland's doing. Charlottetown Belvedere. No, I appreciate, I appreciate the, the description of the rationale behind because obviously, again, it's a significant investment and, and it's, it sounds like it's one that's worth making in the context of decisions that are here. Um, um, the, I guess the other question is, is what I've previously spoken about the importance of the, the community sector and the, the non-profit space, which is in its own way as much a part of the labour market as the more traditional sectors, um, employees 
thousands of people, all those that that part. Is there any um, opportunity or plan to coordinate um, data regarding that sector in the labour plans here? Well, most certainly, from my understanding, you, you look at all our programs that we roll out and all the providers and the non profits they all have a part to play, um, as well as uh, the Minister of Social Development and Housing. That's one thing we've uh, we've been doing this year as well, is more correspondence with their, his department and what's taking place there to make sure everybody's on the same page. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely on that path. Um, I'm hoping to have a little more information in the next... 15 to 20 days of what it looks like, and a little more that I'll be able to share, but uh, that's that's part of the plan right now. Charlottetown Belvedere. Okay, and then I guess the last piece on this one is, is when we, we've also talked previously about sort of the retention settlement and so on and how it relates to youth, and so we, my colleague has mentioned, you know, about graduate mentorship and so on, but um, labour market as it relates to, to youth, and one of the aspects of that is how do we have more youth involved actually in government? Um, so the hiring and, and, and um, apprenticeship or mentorship of, of youth into government, is there any way to, to ensure that that is also on the radar? Yeah, certainly that's been discussions as well. I know uh, my department and the Minister of Education's department uh, have been talking on this as well. Uh, Holland College and UPEI have had some input in this as well. So I, I think now um, the famous saying when governments always work in silos, I think we're, we're finally getting out of that. Uh, we're doing a lot more communication. I found especially this last year, um, so uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know how long it's going to take to, to get it right, but uh, I think we're on the right path with it. Um, Thank you, Chair. You're, you're welcome. Um, I may add on this too, Minister, most of the questions that I've had in my mind have been uh, asked and answered so far, but I do think these programs uh, would never really take off or be of any benefit if it wasn't for some of the staff that were involved. So I have to mention two in particular that I deal with through, uh, through Skills PEI, primarily um, in my district, and that's uh, Cora Gadet uh, Shea, who is a program coordinator, and Jody Gavin Sharp, who is a uh, employment officer. Um, they do a tremendous job. Anytime someone comes in to me for a constituent for direction for employment, I know that I can send them to Jody or Cora, and they're going to be well received and give the best possible direction that, uh, that, 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 that they can provide. And the feedback that I get from my constituents is just, is, is just great. So I want to commend so, them and, and for the programs that are involved with it. And I, I should take the time to thank them as well, because you look at all the programs that were rolled out through COVID, if it wasn't for the staff of the department and through Skills PEI, um, they were up till eight, nine o'clock at night rolling these programs out, mm -hmm. and we were up a couple of weeks ago to the Honourable Member O'Leary and Verness uh, for, for a visit, and just to check in to see how the programs were doing or whatever. And um, I believe there was eight or nine of them up there that day, and uh, the amount of work they've done uh, for Islanders is phenomenal, mm -hmm. above and beyond what they, uh, what their job uh, uh, is. So uh, they 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 have helped us get us through COVID. So Great. I commend them as well. Shall the section carry? Carry. Apprenticeship. Um, appropriations provided for the administration of apprenticeship training and certification of tradespersons. Administration, 10,100. Equipment, 7,000. Material supplies and services, 16,800. Professional services, 212,500. Salaries, 600, uh, 601,600. Travel and training, 30,400. Grants, the blended learning for apprentices, 265,300. Women in construction trades, 402,100. Other, 50,500. Total apprenticeship, 1,596,300. Shall the section carry? Or, sorry, Charlotte on Belvedere. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> no, I, it was not a try. You were not in your head in agreement with me, so that didn't indicate to me you wanted the question. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, Professional services in this in this section is is that a jump or is that an accounting line change? It's sorry on the the we do have an increase in the budget yeah. um, related to curriculum overview, um, which they do a look at their curriculum every now and then and um, modernize, and we also have an amount in there for the apprenticeship management system, which. Um, we're working on, and we'll have extra costs associated with with development of that. Charlotte Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, okay, so, so sorry, that's the curriculum development for the delivery of the apprenticeship program? It's curriculum overview. Oh, okay. So it would be, I believe it's part of the harmonization pro project to make sure that curriculum and outcomes are similar across the Atlantic provinces. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you for that clarification. Um, we, you know, moving on to the um, piece around grants and that you've got blended learning and the women in trades. Um, I know we have the tr women in trades program um, that's being delivered with Trade Trade Horizons. Is that the is that the only program that's being funded by this or with this department? I'd have to take that information back. Cheryl Town Belvedere. Are there any federal funds that we're able to leverage um, to support women in trades in addition to the funds provided through the department? There would be fed federal funds associated with this, yes. Cheryl Town Belvedere. Thank you. Um, and the, I know that the program is delivered in partnership with um, uh, Women's Network PEI um, and um, the Construction Association of PEI, is that correct? I'd have to go back to get the exact details on that. I do know the Construction Association is part, but I don't know what to, to what degree. Um, let me go back and get a, a high-level note on that and, and bring you some info. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, and, and I had raised previously, Minister, a concern um, uh, with you relating to, again, EI eligibility and, and the challenges for somebody who, who wanted to be in the program and just couldn't get past the barriers. I wanted to appreciate, uh, thank you for your department's response on that one. I think it does speak to, again, some of the, the, the ongoing challenges of, because, you know, somebody who spoke up was able to be assisted, but we don't know how many other women might have just given up because they, they felt they were being told that they weren't welcome. Um, once women are able to get into the program, are they, are they reporting a good experience in terms of the, the program itself? Yes, yeah. Any, anyone that has reached out to me uh, has, been, has been good. I haven't heard anything negative directly. Um, I think, you know, where we need to continue maneuvering some of these programs, because, like I say, times have changed, right? And, and you look with what's going on in the construction industry right now, if we would have known this 10 years ago, um, the trend because we're, we're in a significant shortage right now uh, but as simple as is getting our youth involved uh, beforehand we couldn't even get into a school to talk about trades right so mm -hmm. that's all these little things that feed into this because there's a, a lot of opportunity in, in the construction side right now that uh, we need to uh, make an easy path forward the best we can to support our youth our women and, and men all in uh, all in this industry Charlottetown Belvedere Thank you. Um, you know, I've spoken before about long memories and being old in the house, and uh, um, they remember being in high school and having there being a really clear choice at that time in the 80s of, of, of choosing trades, um, and that there was also a stigma associated with that. So that's definitely something that we've we've been challenged with for a long time. That the idea that success looks like a university education, and we need to be really much better at doing that. The, the additional layer for women to enter into those fields um, is, is, an, is a missed opportunity, and it's, and it's really important that we're doing that now. Um, but, Minister, I am hearing that, that there's not necessarily support where it should be from industry or from industry people who, who we would want to be allies in this. Um, and so it, it is really hard to bring forward concerns if you are, if you really want to be in that space, mm -hmm. you can't speak up because if you do, it's going to be worse. That's and all. That that's all info I, I would love to, to hear, right? And, and I often said I can't make changes if I if I don't know about them. Um, what I do know is there's a huge demand right now in the construction industry, and it doesn't look like it's going to to slow down. Um, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of partners, but at the end of the day, everybody's got to work together to get to the end result, uh, where that might not have happened in the past. Um, the co contractors right now, you know, I'm getting calls every week from contractors that are saying, just get me a body. I will train. I'll do what I need to do. And I think maybe that's a path we, we need to look forward to, to go as well. Um, 
the contractors are almost willing to do all the education themselves. Um, we just need to, to provide them the person. So um, I think there's a, a good opportunity. But any concerns, I, please reach out to me. Uh, it'll be confidential, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll do what I can. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Minister. I appreciate that. Um, it is um, and has always has and will continue to be an ongoing piece. But the more the more we shift the narrative, the, the you know that that support is actually there, and it's not just a, a thing that we've said on the poster. Then then it, mm -hmm. it, it works. Um, you spoke about education, and I think that's a really important piece. When we talk about how is the how it's not the province's role to to. You know they can't be everywhere to, to, to fix this, but because that, so it has to come from the ground up. But part of that is through making people aware of their responsibility, and some of that could be th through things like gender-friendly workplaces. Are there bathrooms that are safe and appropriate? Mm -hmm. um, are are is the lighting appropriate if you're working out of hours? Um, you know, are are you ensuring that that people understand their obligations to provide a safe and gender-friendly workplace? All valid points. Yeah. Belvedere. Sorry, I missed that. No, all valid points. Like I say, feel re free to reach out, and I don't okay. mind having a one-on-one, -on -one, um, getting as much info as I can from from everyone and anybody that might have concerns on that. Um, we're we're making changes right now with a lot of our programs, trying to fix as many things as we can. What I have found in this department, a lot of simple changes make big impacts. Yeah. Um, but I, I need to be aware of them. So, so just yeah. like I say, feel free to reach out, and I'll, it will be in confidence. Charlton Belvedere. Thank you, and and I, I think um, you know, um, like we've talked about in other instances, being open to that experiential feedback. You know, we. we it's really, it can be really difficult to be challenged with something that we know is a good idea when we hear somebody say that my experience wasn't and this is what I have to tell you. But then, but, but to be able to learn from that and say, um, you know, this isn't necessarily everybody's experience, but, but we, we see and we hear you. Um, it really, really goes a really long way. So I appreciate Definitely. that, Minister. Um, I'll move for somebody else to do questions, Chair. Sure. Charlotte on Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the Women in Trades program, I had been in touch with um, a few people when there was an issue with them not getting their child care checks. Um, it was worked out in the end, but it took a month after they were told they were going, going to get it. So that was a huge barrier for, for a lot of these women. And so I, I'm wondering about um, the funds that go to the, the employers the people who are taking on um, women apprentices. Um, so I had some concerns from a constituent who said that government is basically throwing money away to some of these employers because, and, and I'm dr just drawing this to your attention, but because they're not following their part of the deal. And so essentially um, I've heard from women who are on the job and they are trained to build cabinets, let's say, and they're told they're not allowed to do that. They have to sweep and they have to clean up. So, so there's a lot of those things happening. I'm not saying every one is like that, but that is happening and also complaints of sexual harassment in the workplace. So I'm wondering what, is there any sort of follow up done with the employ with, uh, I'm using the word employer, but businesses who are taking on women apprentices? There would be follow-up to what detail, I don't know. And I guess going back to Summerside Wilmont on the graduate mentorship, this is something like similar I was talking about. Um, you know, these programs are designed to get somebody into a full-time job and into the workforce, uh, not to be um, a free body for three months and then laid off into the next person, right? So all these issues are concerns. Um, like I say, if, if you're hearing it, I need to, to know about them to try and make these changes because uh, if there's that happening on, on the job sites and they're not living up to their end of the bargain, that's not acceptable and we have to find a path forward to, to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. I was talking to someone in the department and they kind of let me know there were a lot of changes happening in there. There is. And yeah. they've assured me that they're on it and they're working on it, which reminds me I need to follow up with that. So that's good for now. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Shall the section carry? Carry. Total workforce development, 33,742,200. Shall I carry? Carry. Total Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, 39,980,700. Shall I carry? Carry. 
Is there a change with innovation, or hmm? is there a change with innovation, or the same? Yeah. Oh, yes, sorry. There is a change. Yeah. Okay. No, no change. No change. Okay, honorable members. We will be now moving on to innovation PEI, which would be page 35. So 36. 36, innovation PEI. Corporation management. Appropriations provided for the administration of the corporation. Administration 227,700. Equipment 12,500. Material supplies and services 20,000. Professional services 50,000. Salaries 1,238,200. Travel and training, 32,000. Total corporation management, 1,580,400. Tell the section carry. 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 Total corporation management, 1,580,400. Shall carry. Business development, business attraction, and emerging sectors. Appropriations provided for, the, for leading the attraction of new businesses and business partners to the province, which, com, um, which complement the provincial economy. Salaries. 964,600, travel and training, 37,500, total business attraction in emerging sectors, 1,002,100. Shall the section carry? Section. Cheryl Tom Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, how has the work of this section been affected by the pandemic? <laughs> well, it's been affected drastically, but it's worked out relatively well. So. Uh, Obviously, through innovation and the business attraction, uh, the planes were in the air at all times, and there was uh, staff on them trying to recruit and, and bring business here. So it's all changed to online now, um, but it's worked out real well considering you know we're we're uh, in a work world pandemic right now that everybody's in the same boat. So uh, I've uh, I've talked to the staff on this, and uh, for the most part, it's it's worked relatively well. Uh, they're keeping their contacts close, and they're still. Uh, uh, some good opportunities coming to PEI, and uh, as soon as it's safe to travel again, I'm sure uh, I'm sure they'll be back on a plane. Sure, I'm Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Do you, do you see, or have you had feedback from the department? They're really going to be rethinking about how they do that business outreach, though, in the future as well, because the tradi you know tradition is is going to change. Oh, de definitely. It's uh, one thing with COVID, we've we've learned things that we didn't think could be done before, and this is this is exactly one yeah. of them. Um, Right from uh, Zoom calls to conferences online now and so forth. So I certainly think you'll see uh, see more of it happen in the future. Cheryl Town Belvedere. I don't think anybody's going to miss packing marketing materials for, for flight for flight bags again. Um, the, we had, uh, my colleague um, uh, from Summerside had previously been asking about the clean tech fund. Is that is that where we're going to see that fund um, end up? Is in this emerging sector? Uh, no. No. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where it would fall on, under the budget side of it. Um, so that clean tech fund is going to be run out of innovation. Okay. Um, we're still in the process of what it looks like. Which once the minister of environment gets on the floor, he'll be able to talk more about that. Okay. But it will be housed at an innovation department. I'm just not sure what section. It's probably program. Sure, Tom Belvedere. I would guess. Okay. Thank you. No, I look forward to, to speaking to him about that. But the but the implementation of that is going to happen with innovation PEI That's in right. the long run. That's right. Yep. Thank you. Sure, I'm Belvedere. Thank you, and I and I, I know we have sort of the existing kind of model that looks um, with bio bio food biotech, sorry, and and kind of the food partnership and those other things. So we're looking at potential. I guess the minute, other minister will answer, but it's it's that kind of a, an idea about the the funds and the management coming through under the innovation umbrella. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, the details are still being finalised. What that what's that looks like, and I know the minister of environment gets on, he'll uh, he'll be able to talk to it a little more. Uh, on the food side, which I know you mentioned yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, we've got some real good initiatives, which I'm just not quite ready to announce yet. But uh, I think you'll be quite happy when the time is when the time comes that uh, we can, we can speak about it. But uh, uh, we're we're close, and there's something in the works there. Cheryl Hound Belvedere. More exciting news. I appreciate that, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Cornwall Meadowbank. Now she took my question again. <laughs> um, shall the section carry? Culture Development and Growth Fund. Appropriations provided for the Culture Development and Growth Fund. Equipment, 700. Material supplies and services, 1,900. Professional services, 10,000. Salaries, 486,000. Did someone? Oh, sorry. OK, salaries, 486,500. Travel and training, 11,800. Grants, 3,642,100. Uh, 
Total Culture Development and Growth Fund, four million one hundred fifty-three thousand. Charlottetown Belvedere. Chair. So we know that the um, the culture um, the cultural plans. development and growth fund has uh, come out of the um, strategic action plan. Is it that's going into its fourth year? I think is that correct? Thank sure you. Um, uh, and the um, the primary activity of this area is under the the, the grants, which are significant. Um, one two almost two million. Is that correct? Sound about right? Looking at the line again, now. three point five million. Two million specifically to um, the cultural industry is what you've got in the in your in the breakdown. Up. Yep. Could you tell me where the other two million are going? Or is that just a variance? No, there is actually what happened in in the current year, the culture grants were actually run out of two different areas, one within the department and one within Innovation PEI. But we've consolidated them to, to Innovation PEI and unfortunately in the process we had missed some of, uh, some of the grants and the handouts. So um, most of them are related to performance venue funding. So there's an additional 900 and some thousand to Confederation Center. Um, some 88,000 to ARSA, and uh, there's a small amount of funding to Theatre PEI. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. That's kind of, I was going to ask you where they were, so that makes it, yeah. So, so that was the. Apologize. The, no, so that's that's the um, venue grants that were previously administered by Mark Derry and, and his. That's sector, correct. Is that right? Okay, so Confederation Centre, um, the Guild, and other smaller venues. Okay, thank you. Charlotte on Belvedere. Thank you. Um, so when I look at the, um, um, you know, the list of the grants in here, so you've got some really large recipients, like, uh, and, and the guild show up in here again, as a, uh, with grants on, as um, industry grants rather than their venue grant. Um, is there a reason why, sort of, they would then come back and get additional grants on top of, or is, are, were they for specific events, or? It could be. We don't have what that would be. I'd have to okay. check with the department and see what uh, what that extra grant is. Okay. And, and, a, and a piece of this in terms of how they were categorized would be because some were administered previously by the department. And when we moved to Innovation PEI, the database just wasn't set up to categorize them appropriately. So some could, could be in there, but they're actually related to performance venue. The hour has been called. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Show Cherry. Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Morrell, Donna, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the Member from Montague Kilmer, that this House do adjourn until uh, April 6th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Shall it carry? <laughs> Enjoy your long weekend, Easter weekend. Stay out of the chocolate. <laughs>